Good day, brothers and sisters. This is the other Paul, and I am joined by a very special guest right here, River Devereaux of New Kingdom Media. Mate, how are you going? I'm I'm great, thank you, and thanks so much, Paul, for having me here. It's always great to talk to you, mate. No problem. Absolute privilege. Finally, it's super awesome. We can finally get this collab going. Since uh, shout out to Father James for putting us together. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> very excellent stuff. Mate, before we jump right into it, give us give us a speed run of yourself, your content, and all that. Uh, I I live in New Zealand. I'm an Anglican. I'm part of the Church of Confessing Anglicans here in New Zealand. Um, this is a GAFCON uh, affiliated church. I run a YouTube channel called New Kingdom Media, where I mainly talk about Orthodox Anglicanism informed by the formularies of the church. So I'm, I'm sort of a Re reformation Anglican in the sense that I, I strictly uh, adhere to the homilies and the 39 articles and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, recently I have written some articles on the North American Anglican. And the first of those was about Nicaea two and why it is that the book of homilies, especially, but also the 39 articles uh, refute Nicaea two, why they don't, um, Ascent to Nicaea to and why they are opposed to the veneration of religious images. Excellent. Very excellent stuff. So those are some good articles. I don't, did I link them down below? I don't know if I did, um, but if I didn't, yeah, no, I didn't. Okay. So if I didn't, <clears throat> either I will link them down myself or someone because I am too lazy and or just too busy with the stream, someone else can grab them, throw them in there. Otherwise, though, I will definitely link them at least after the fact as well so here's who we got in the chat right now dr bob mate what up one of my legendary and loyal supporters shout out to you peccator justificatus greetings to the zwinglian and to the anglo calvinists i'm glad that you dive into this topic why thank you very much Let's which start. one's the zwinglian <laughs> what up what up oh, yeah yeah <laughs> now you're just thinking like uh yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you just exit from the stream straight away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But um, yes, so this is happening. And we got Ben Peters here. Hey, yeah. I know River. He's cool. Yeah, is this ben, like a ben personal relationship? Or? Yeah, no, we just know each other through um, online stuff. Yeah. Same show. That's cool. But uh, yes, yeah, speaking of supporters, mad shout out to my supporters. And I forgot again to update... I have this little fancy list that I show of all my supporters to give them a nice shout out. But uh, thank you all so very much for supporting me, everyone who is right now. Um, super legendary, <clears throat> helping me turn this into a job, which, um, and one day I do hope that this becomes a genuinely living income. And so if you want to support the ministry yourself, anyone who's considering that, you can head to the subscribe star link down below shown in this banner. It would be absolutely fantastically appreciated. It'll help me up quality for everything on this channel, equipment, software, you name it. I have some plans for things for next pay, uh, stuff to be investing in, such as potentially Epidemic Sound, which would basically give me any and all music and audio byte options that I want for like anything. It's, it's a really, really fantastic website. Um, and so your support will be going towards things like that um, and generally just improving everything with the ministry. So thank you so much again. Oh, and of course, you get some very nice benefits as well, which you can also see in the subscribe star page. So everyone who's supporting me, thank you so much. Anyone who's considering it, check out the link down below. <clears throat> now, plug over. Sorry, I've got a little thing on my throat right now. Let's take a look, last look at people before we commence. So hype for this, yes, sacramentarians. Me? Sacramentarian? <laughs> Man, I had to choose between you and Bailey Protestant for live streams and you won. Let's... Let's go, boys. Let's go. Hello, gents. Looking forward to this one. Likewise, good to see you, Andy. Good to see you. Listening from the gym, very based. Getting my physical and more importantly, spiritual training in. How good. Hello, Samuel. Good to see you. I just came from the gym, resting bottle and training the mind, very based. Okay, so <clears throat> let us commence by discussing our aims. Our aims for this stream ultimately are quite simple to debunk the iconophile case given at Nicaea, at the Second Council of Nicaea, and uh, and do so by providing a positive biblical articulation of the status of images, both in general and in with respect to veneration, quote unquote. Um, and there's a reason why we will give scare quotes to the term of veneration, um, as well as generate, <clears throat> demonstrate some more basic uh, principles 
that really do underlie this quite heavily <clears throat> and and frankly just unnecessary for scripture at all to be um of really of any effect and of any comprehensibility so issues of the sufficiency and the perspicuity of scripture we're actually going to commence with that um uh, in order to really frame our discussion here but i'd argue that even 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 if one was to just not cover that at all that our case is just going to be that good and tight um that it just it, you couldn't you couldn't willingly ignore what we say and and just say that nicaea 2 was totally like totally right with everything where we're hoping to really really demonstrably um demonstrate the error of such a council and such a view um so yeah, that's uh, that's our that's our general direction. Uh, River, you have any initial uh, initial thoughts of where you want to go? Yeah, I just want to say, look, with 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 Nicaea too, there's a lot of uh, ways that we can approach attacking it, um, and and the scriptural attack is is one thing. Another one would be the historical case against it, showing how it, it fails to meet the criteria for an ecumenical council, showing it, the corruption of the people there the um sort of preposterous levels of corruption of the empress who presided it and sort of appointed lackeys who were going to be there representing her position um you know we're taking the scriptural route because from a protestant perspective only scripture is infallible and so scripture becomes the means by which we kind of evaluate all other truth claims and so we can look at scripture and compare it to Nicaea 2. And if, if it fails to match up, we can say Nicaea 2 is not true. If someone has the presupposition that an ecumenical council is infallible and you do not have the right of private judgment to compare scripture to, to Nicaea 2 because Nicaea 2 is infallible and that's that, then, then you can just take the historical route there and just show that, that Nicaea 2 isn't an ecumenical council anyway. Yeah. Um, so there's just, there's lots of ways to do this, but I think, yeah, focusing yeah. on scripture is probably the most edifying anyway. Yeah, that's it. A hundred percent. And, um, and that, that ironically is the very, that's the exact method and direction that, uh, that Irenaeus goes with arguing the Gnostics. He first went through scripture saying, boom, scripture destroy you guys. Um, but then he says, but some of these guys may say that the scriptures are, um, they'll, they'll try to impute the scriptures authority and try to say that they're unclear and this and this mm -hmm. and that. And then he says, okay, in that case, let's go to the tradition slash history of the churches themselves to see that you guys are just simply not what you claim. So yeah, same direction yeah. as he, um, just got to love Irenaeus, the proto Protestant himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, very Protestant in many of his things. There is no scriptural support for iconoclasm. Incorrect. That's right. Anyway, and we have to prove it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, sorry. Iconoclasm. <clears throat> yeah well, uh, he, well here's the thing like that. <laughs> we're not we're not we're not claiming to be fallen iconoclasts destroy any images and that um it's just simply it's just simply refuting um iconodulia like you could you could look at um the council of frankfurt and the resultant libri carolini the carol the carolingian books i believe that's how you'd say it or the caroline books um and they say yes destroying images shouldn't do that they're useful but venerating them, that's bad. That's pretty much what we're going to be saying today. Yeah, but I think it's then, worth noting that both both you and I, Paul, uh, are, f are fine with images in and of themselves. I have I have um, paintings of Jesus and saints in my home. Uh, you're wearing a yeah, you're wearing a crucifix right now, right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So like we're okay with images in and of themselves. Yeah. The issue is venerating them. The issue is is um, showing them affection. Yep. in a religious manner that's the problem yeah um, obviously is, there's yeah. other issues too about like depicting the trinity but even nicaea mm. to agree that that's unacceptable yeah. um so yeah and, but you know what's so funny even though we're not iconoclasts ironically there is even still way more support in holy scripture for iconoclasm for the destruction of images than there is for iconodulia like you can find oh, plenty yeah. of examples in scripture of them yeah. destroying images that were objects of worship <laughs> so, so yeah, even, even, even then, even then the iconoclasts still have the one up. Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay. And this, this is going to be, this is going to be something good that we're going to be addressing. Exodus 24, five isn't opposing images. It's opposing idols, which are worshiped in the place of the one true God. Mm, okay. Um, well, we'll, yeah, we'll, we're, we're going to, we're going to be getting to that. Um, especially if you ask simple questions about what's an idol, what makes something an idol, you know, um, mm. sure of idols, not images themselves. And there is something we're going to show is that biblically speaking, there is practically no difference between an image and, uh, and an idol. An idol is an image and an image is an idol. What makes something an idol 
is that it is it refers to something it represents something and then you are worshiping that thing through the image um mm -hmm. so there's there's practically no difference except function um but yes uh anyway so i believe river uh we wanted to start with the issues of the perspicuity and sufficiency of scripture yeah so you know um since we're going to be approaching this from a protestant perspective um the the formal principle of of protestantism is sola scriptura and sola scriptura means it involves a few things one of them is that only scripture is infallible uh, but it also means that um, scripture contains the sufficient teaching and information for everything of importance in the Christian life. So if we presuppose that, then that means that we, as we approach the, the scriptural witness on images, we are going to presuppose that what we find will be sufficient for us to have a clear opinion on the matter. There's not, it's not lacking anything. We have to turn to some external source for for information. That is a very important presupposition. A Roman Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox person might not have that presupposition. And they might they might presuppose that scripture is not sufficient for the issue. You can't believe that as a Protestant. We believe that since only scripture is infallible, only scriptures God breathed, God in his love and grace ensures that hmm. you no know, scripture is going to contain the sufficient information. He's not going to sort of abandon us to seek truth from a source you can't even trust to be infallible. Um, okay, so we'll start off with, with sufficiency uh, in terms of like scriptural, uh, a quick sort of scriptural case for it. In Jude, um, verse 3, uh, Jude talks about how the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Yep. Um, and then in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, this is quite a famous one. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So that's, I, I feel like that's quite a clear little text for <clears throat> yeah. there. Yeah. Um, equipped for every good work. Um, now, a, as part of like sort of flowing from sufficiency is what we call perspicuity. Perspicuity means that scripture is clear. Um, if, you, if you read the scriptural witness on a certain issue, it will have a clear meaning. You won't have to struggle too hard to know what it's saying. You're not going to have to be an expert in Hebrew and Greek. You're not going to have to read a whole library of massive tomes to understand it. Uh, you're not going to have to rely on an ecumenical council, so to a uh, so-called ecumenical council that was held 800 years later to even make sense of it. You can read it and you can know what it means. Uh, this is a, you can't like that. That's this is a necessary consequence of sufficiency. If you just say scripture contains the sufficient teaching for an issue, but but isn't actually clear, and you have to rely on some academic guy with a PhD to make sense of it, then it's no longer sufficient <clears throat> on its own. Uh, now, perspicuity is, I think, a little bit easier to prove in terms of what scripture says of itself. Um, Psalm 19 says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So even the simple can approach the testimony of the Lord and become wise, can know what it's saying. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And it also says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Yep. Um, so you clearly don't have to be yep. a Hebrew and Greek scholar yeah. uh, to understand it. And I may even I may even also mention the first the first song of the first book. Oh, sorry, the first song of the I want to say the first the first the, sorry the first stanza of the first song of the first book of Psalms. The very 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 because technically the books of Psalms are five books for anyone who doesn't know. Um, but literally the very very first song that frames the entire thing. And what does the first stanza say? It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like private private study and private interpretation right there. It sounds pretty sounds pretty bad. God's given some pretty bad advice right there for telling people to use their <laughs> use their private judgment yeah. to uh, understand his uh understand his law and to meditate on it. Um That's jokes aside, point. even that passage. It assumes that it is the man of God 
who will come to study the scriptures and will come to understand their truth. And I'd even say even the mere fact that there is a scripture, the mere fact that something was written down and sent to audiences, very largely lay audiences, and it was expected, given that it was written down to them, that they would understand it. That alone <clears throat> demonstrates that these texts were made to be read and understood in themselves. Now, granted, there's issues of how we're 2,000 or 3,000, whatever years removed, different languages, different cultural contexts and all that jazz, which doesn't fundamentally change the whole thing. It makes it makes the process a little bit harder for us. Granted, we uh, when people use Bible translations, they're relying, they're standing on the shoulders of translators and historians who come to accurately distill all that information and bring it into an English translation. Um, but even whether you do that or if you go to study that stuff yourself, it does nonetheless uh, open up the gate of possibility um, and, and potentially, depending on your skill level, ease of being able to come to that intended message because that message was intended to be understood even by a lay audience originally. Um, so I believe even the mere existence of scripture actually demonstrates that it's meant to be perspicuous. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I just want to clarify some things. First of all, in the comments, Solus Christus said, hi, Aussies. Just want a little um, geography <laughs> lesson. New well, Zealand is a it's its own country. It's not, it's not an island of Australia. So do do um, forgive do do forgive my friend River for not recognizing yeah. the vassal state that is um, the fact of the vassal <laughs> status of New Zealand yeah. under Australia. Fun fact: New Zealand was, I think, very close to becoming another state of Australia, but it just didn't go. Uh, Australians love to 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 remind us of that. Yeah, and it's not really true anyway. True. And true. and we love to remind Australians that they used to be a prison country, which explains a lot. Anyways, yeah, we became, um, yeah, and we became the greater power because of it. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen do you know um there was um oh there was a series it was an australian series but you might have seen it where they get professional marketing agencies to create advertisements for really ridiculous ideas like professional ads and one of them was you have to make an ad that pitches yeah. an australian invasion of new zealand <laughs> It was, just, ah. <laughs> it, was just the, it was the funniest that i'm going to show you them after this it was the funniest set of ads though and, oh man but yeah anyway back to back to yeah. what we're talking about um, some of the things to clarify um when we say scripture is perspicuous this doesn't mean it's perspicuous for uh kiwi cope <laughs> for um for the non-elect so the point is if you are illuminated by the holy spirit the holy spirit guides you into understanding its perspicuous meaning um mm -hmm. so we do you know we do acknowledge that heretics read scripture and, and have bizarre interpretations yep. that's because they're not guided by Holy spirit and their their minds are blinded by satan anyway um also the scripture is perspicuous on the matters of importance it's not it's not perspicuous on everything so for instance i don't think scripture is perspicuous about the heavenly realm and exactly what demons are and all that sort of stuff yeah um there's some like for instance is scripture perspicuous on the net on the nephilim and exactly who they are <laughs> and why they survived the flood and that sort of thing no it's not but it's because that it doesn't it's not a matter of importance now i think we would acknowledge though that whether or not you can venerate an image is a matter of importance is very clearly um yep. god very clearly considers it important because a absolutely enormous chunk of the old testament is god talking about how upset he is about idolatry. So it is it's clearly an important question. And so we would say that it's going to be perspicuous about that. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I'd personally add my own clarification as well. Um, well, qualification, maybe slight difference um, from River on the issue of uh, the perspicuity of scripture for unbelievers. I believe that, yeah, the Holy Spirit for the four believers will guide them to um, uh, to at least a good chunk of what is necessary um, in order to believe in scripture or just, just what is necessary period. But I do nonetheless believe that scripture is written in a way where unbelievers, they can understand it, but given the fact that they're unbelievers, they don't have the spirit. They're going to, they're going to find any excuse to deny it. They could perfectly understand. Um, I, I believe, uh, what Holy scripture says about, uh, the message of Christ, about the law, about the condemnation of the law. Um, but, and they could come to perfectly understand that, but then since they're not enlightened by the spirit, they'll just say, yeah, that's bull. See you later. So that's that. That'd be my take. I wonder, I wonder what you'd think about that. No, yeah, I think that's fair enough. That's that's cool. Um, I, I just also believe that non-elect have sort of a spiritual darkening of their minds that will um, potentially also lead to distortions, as um, to like a higher degree. But yeah, sure. 
Um, just to wrap up the sort of pers perspicuity thing, a clear one is Deuteronomy 30. So Moses, after giving the law, says, the knowledge of God's will is not far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will send to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Yeah. That is like... A, that is a perspicuous text on the perspicuous yeah. scripture. Uh, and, uh, ironically, at least for, well, really really the law, really the law in general, because the commandment that Moses is giving, it's not just a specific commandment of you shall not um, eat, uh, you shall not eat a eat a pig on X day or whatever. It's, it's the commandments given in this section is to obey the law, to follow God's footsteps. So literally obey everything that's been said as the law already. And, mm -hmm. that in, and in saying this, it's very ironically, explicitly, and I, I pro perhaps prophetically um, denying a key, like a very key aspect of anti-perspicuity perspicuity arguments, like one key nuance that some of the more, um, some of the more articulate proponents of such arguments will give that like, oh, scripture is a heavenly thing and it can't, and it can't be authentically interpreted by like earthly finite means so you need you need like a, a divine interpreter in order to bring that message to us um but then here you go here you got do it army saying uh no nah, it's not in heaven or in the sea where you guys can't reach it it's like right here here's some words you guys can understand and apply mm, absolutely and 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 at the very least this uh text is talking about the law and as we're going to see the image the, the the issue of images is a lot of it's going to revolve around the law bingo um bingo, yeah bingo and then just for some patri uh, patri uh, blah, blah, patristic witnesses on perspicuity, St. Mm -hmm. Irenaeus accuses the Gnostics of not believing in Scripture's perspicuity. He says, when, however, they are confuted from the Scriptures, they turn around and assert that they are ambiguous and that the truth cannot be extracted from them by those who are ignorant of tradition. He is mm -hmm. accusing them of heresy for this view. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> this exactly. is you can't say oh you can't know what scripture says about images without knowing what tradition says about it Irenaeus is saying that's what the Gnostics believe that's it that's it and in, in addition in that in that very same um I don't know if it's the same book or whatever well it's the same work but I don't know it's the same section um but he will give a very he does give a very explicit positive articulation of the uh, of the perspicuity of scripture as well one which like I, I posted it recently in a tweet and just I don't know if you saw it River but the copes around that fantastic absolutely fantastic yeah. and they did i even predicted in a tweet under it in before um so, uh proof texting irrelevant statements about the church which have nothing to do about what irenae says here sure enough exactly that happened oh irenae says talk about the church irenae says oh, 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 oh. <laughs> which doesn't mean what they think it means but whatever and he yeah. says quote a, and this by the way this is in uh book two chapter 27 um, quote, a sound mind and one which does not expose its possessor to danger and is devoted to piety and the love of truth will eagerly meditate upon those things which God has placed within the power of mankind and has subjected to our knowledge and will make advance advancement in acquaintance with them, rendering the knowledge of them easy to find by means of daily study. These things are such as fall plainly under our observation and are clearly and unambiguously in express terms set forth in the sacred scriptures. Mm. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. That's like it's like if I was if I was just to give that quote on its own, not say who it was from, then 100 percent they say, Oh, what what dirty prot did you quote with that? Like, why should I believe them? And I'm just like, uh -huh. Saint yeah. Irenaeus. <laughs> yeah, I mean Augustine on Christian doctrine also talks about the perspicuity of scripture. Um, saying that the things of importance that concern faith and living are plainly laid down. And he says, if scripture is ever unclear about something, they'll be in another place, it will be able to clarify that, that sort of unclear yeah. section. So yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. there. Obviously the Protestants, the Protestant reformers believed in perspicuity and um, Luther said that, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm a bit chesty too. Luther said that the reformation in many ways hinges on perspicuity. Uh, and yeah. he actually says it's a shameless blasphemy to not believe in it. But, you know, I, I think yeah. we wouldn't go that far. Obviously, Luther tends to exaggerate things. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see where yeah. it comes from, though, because it's functionally to deny perspicuity is basically to say that the Holy Spirit was just some, was just rambling and blathering and not really say anything of meaning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So at the very least, as Protestants, we have to we have to take this uh, this doctrine seriously. 
Okay, well, that's, that's right. everything I had to say about sufficiency and perspicuity. Yep, that's right. Yeah, and you you basically said everything I would have said anyway. So I think that's a that's a that's a nice and good start. Um, yeah, not really much else to to go on with that. Um, should we look at now? Or I think we'll so I think we'll look at this during or after the presentation itself. But Ben says, "Hey, so you both have said icons slash pictures of Christ slash a crucifix, just not in worship. So how do you respond to the presby argument that even pictures outside of worship is wrong because?" It is wait wait wait. Pictures outside of worship is wrong because it is because it is wor worship. As Sorry, the, I think he's saying because it is worship. The the construction of the image in itself. Me create. Um, I just say they're wrong, and I think we can maybe if we feel like it another time. I don't know, or maybe after this presentation, after we've like really gone into the yeah. meat of it, then we can show how the same passages wouldn't prove certain yeah. presby or reform and just to give you a good Christ. example like i'm i'm reading a picture book bible to my to my infant son and so it does have depictions of jesus and stuff i you know i don't really see what the issue there is yeah uh, jesus yep. did live at a he was a man like so you can depict him um yep. but yeah just not yeah but that's it that's it that's a dip depiction and i call it julia up simply not the same thing the no i see it too was correct to point out how scripture, there were multiple examples of them making images of certain kinds. And so the argument that simply having images itself as a second commandment violation, they they could very easily refuse. A child could look at the Bible and say, hey, there's a picture mentioned here and just say how the iconoclasts were wrong in that respect. Yeah. Um, but of course, where the deception comes is in then trying to tag along iconodulia uh, with that concept, with the, uh, with the existence of images. Um, but yes, anyway, I guess this means now we're going to move on to a positive biblical case against Icon of Julia. So how this is going to work today, people, is we're first going to present our own positive case against the veneration of images. And frankly, we just call it the worship of images. Like we understand this is not us um, mix, uh, missing categories from the opposition. We know the opposition has a worship veneration distinction, Latria Dulia, Latria Proskinesis, whatever it is, distinction. Um, thing is, we deny that distinction. We don't believe that distinction works. In, well, not, not that there is no such distinction at all, although I'd, I personally have a different distinction, um, but just that in this case, it doesn't work. That any um, any service, any any veneration simpliciter is itself idolatry. So you may see me, for example, just say a lot the worship of images. So if I do that, don't, don't go complain in the comments. We don't believe we worship the images. We just venerate them. <laughs> Please don't. Yeah, we're saying that's we not that. a distinction we recognize. We know the distinction. Yeah. We deny it. Um, so, and we're going to, we're going to show, we're not just going to assume that the distinction doesn't exist. We're going to show why that distinction either doesn't exist or just doesn't matter in this case. Um, yeah. Hey, and just so, to say, um, first of all, I saw a comment. Someone mentioned the fiery serpent. We're going to yeah, be getting that. Classic. Um, but, but, yeah. We, we're we're going to address, address that now or after? Sorry? We're going to address that now or after? Because no, I think no, this we'll, was... It'll come, we'll, in, it'll, it'll come in time. It's actually yeah, we'll going to... Because yeah. that's one of the things Nice CO2 will point out. Like, oh, look, there's things. There's yeah. images. <laughs> so we can kind of address that there. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so first we'll make our own positive biblical case against the worship of images. And then after that, we will look at uh, we'll look at a general overview of the key arguments and theology of Nicaea two regarding the veneration of images, and then we will point by point refute that. Um, yep. And there's going to be a, it's going to be very interesting once we get to the Nicaea two arguments as well, because I'll tell you right now, this was actually tough to research for, and I won't say why just yet. But once we get there, I'll say why. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just want to start by one one little thing because I, I don't think it's going to come in later. Um, we 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 recognize that uh, there is a difference between religious veneration and maybe what you would call civic veneration. Okay, so um, can you or should you bow before royalty or a magistrate or something? Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. civic veneration, but it's not religious veneration. And there there is a distinction. Like uh, to give to give an example, God rest her soul. But would it be okay for me to kiss the hand of the queen? To show civic veneration, yes. But if my wife caught me kissing the hand of a young woman my age in a restaurant, would that be okay? No, because we're clearly seeing a distinction between roman romantic affection and civic affection. Yeah. We're going to say the same thing about civic affection and um, religious affection. So, so yeah, just I think that's just important to keep that in mind for everyone for for later on. Okay, scriptural That's case. It. All right.
let us let us get right started. And I think we get I think we commence with the OG passage itself, Exodus chapter 20. Um, the second commandment to be nice and specific. Um, but yes, I'll just read that section. I'll just read that section out here. So I've got this very nice step Bible. Thank you very much, River, for showing me this, like literally just before this stream. I've never seen this thing before. <laughs> it is super awesome, super helpful. And so this passage reads, and God spoke, and by the way, this is the ESV translation, but we have the OG language as well. So if someone wants to freak out about how the ESV does things, don't worry, you got the language right here. Um, and God spoke all these things saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall now bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Uh, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So pretty much what we'd say in a positive articulation, this is just our case right here. It's not even a matter of uh, a passage gives some principles and some ideas, and then we logically um, build up to our position. It, this is just quite literally, we, we submit, this is just our position straight up. You shall not make a carved image or any likeness of anything in earth, earth above or below. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. That's quite simple. That's quite simply our case, of course, in as we would argue. Just to clarify, though, we are interpreting this commandment to be saying that the 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 focus of the commandment is on the don't bow. You can yeah. obviously make a carved image of something. God commands that later on, um, but it's the bowing before it that's the the issue that's at it. hand. Now, yeah, that's it. Um, the really important thing to make clear about this, and we're going to have to get into a little bit of uh, Greek for for people. This this is where it's all going to hinge on. So Nicaea two is going to say there is a distinction between two Greek verbs. Uh, before you before you do that, did you want to? Uh, I'm I'm trying to think right now. I'm sorry we didn't. I should should have brought this up earlier. Do you want to mention what Nicaea two says now, or do you just want to focus purely on a positive articulation and then do? Uh, um, I was just gonna I was just gonna quickly explain the verb thing and then leave it there. Oh, no if, problem. I think that's fair. So. Just to keep in mind for people, Nicaea 2 will end up saying there's a distinction between proskuneo and latruo. Proskuneo mm. is what's typically translated as veneration, and latruo is what's typically translated as vener as sorry, as worship. Proskuneo, veneration, latruo, worship. Here in this commandment, in the LXX or the Septuagint translation, which ironically the Eastern Orthodox Church considers to be the sort of standard Bible and the Roman Catholic Church, correct me if I'm wrong, since they have the um oh I've completely blanked on what it's called, the the Latin translation of the Bible. Ah, uh, the Vulgate. The Vulgate. The Vulgate's Old Testament is based on the Septuagint. So the Septuagint translation, uh, when God says you shall not bow down to them or serve them, the Greek verb for bow down is proskunesis from proskuneo. And the Greek word for serve them is Latrusis. So he's saying, thou shalt not venerate or worship them. <laughs> so mm. he's making mm. it pretty clear that you can't you can't use this this silly distinction to get out of this one because they're both there. And I think Paul and I said before the stream started that we believe that's that is literally divine providence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God made sure that, that would happen. So uh, yeah, but okay, yeah. I think. We'll, We'll move it, on. It's we'll either divine providence or just like a genuine, like hilarious blunder on the part of the icon of duels at the council. Because as far as I've, as far as I've read, like the second commandment just does not exist in the second council of Nicaea. Like they just do not, they don't even, they don't even bother to try to give an account for it. And uh, I think either, either they just genuinely forgot about it, which would be like an absolute miracle of silliness or they saw how their own terminology like would destroy them. And then they're just like, mm -hmm. and that, and that kind of makes sense because um, as uh, actually as father, uh, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll leave it as the thing, but basically Nicaea 2 didn't really give um, ironically, didn't really actually articulate a full throated positive theology of image veneration. It was primarily apologetic. So just defending the practice itself um, with, with certain statements on theology here and there, but otherwise it didn't really try to give a full coherent vision of what they actually believe, which is very important. Very, very important. 
Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, is there any any more you want to say here, River? No, I, th I think the com the commandment speaks for itself. Obviously, uh, some Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox will say this is not a commandment in and of itself. It's they they have a different order of the Ten Commandments, so they'll say this is part of the first commandment. I think the case to refute that is pretty open and shut, but I don't even think we need to get into yep. it. Um, and I don't it think it affects it anyway. Yeah, I don't think I, I think that'd just be a big that'd just be a big red herring anyway, because like what actually changes with the fact that not making a carved image of any likeness in anything that is in heaven above or on the earth below or in the sea under the earth are the saints and the Virgin Mary and all that. Are they things which are on earth or in the heavens above and the water below and all that? If that, if that is the case, then it, and it frankly doesn't matter because to simply give such a, a, an attempt at a prescriptive argument, like, Oh, it just says don't to do it, not to do it about gods. And Oh, we don't consider the saints gods, but that's actually really, shall we say, linguistically arrogant when you think about it. It's just like, oh, look, they labeled these things gods. We don't label our things gods, so therefore it doesn't apply to us. Yeah, Which exactly. is absolutely silly. What's, what makes something a god is its function in the scripture. And with scripture, it's quite simply just supernatural beings that have some have devotion dedicated towards them. It really oh, not is even that. They can call emperors and stuff gods too. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Judges as well. I um, just answered a question in the chat. We were talking about Greek Greek verbs there. Yeah, we're talking uh, about Greek, um, which is most relevant because um, the, the Septuagint was like the primary version used by much of the early church um, yeah. because pa Hebrew apparently well, didn't really care much about it, unfortunately. Uh, and likewise for the Second Council of Nicaea, the Septuagint they would use. But then when we actually look at the text of Septuagint itself, it's like, oh boy, oh dear, There's some big problems there for their own uh, position. But then likewise, we can also look at the Hebrew um, itself where it would say, and because uh, ironically, the Septuagint, one could say it's a bit more specific than the Hebrew otherwise is. So the Septuagint would say Latruo. And on the basis of that, um, Iconoduals may say, oh, look, it's just saying not to Latruo images, which is cool because we don't Latruo images, or rather we say we don't Latruo images. We just dulia them. We just slap some dulia on it and call it a day and that therefore it's okay. Um, but then of course, if you look at the Hebrew itself where it uses, um, it uses more specific wording much 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 more specific wording um quite simply abad you shall not serve it's a very generic word abad serve service um it doesn't have any particular uh connotation of worship as to the one true transcendent god as would often latria be defined it just simply means service it's it's very simple um but yeah not much else here or and peter's um there's actually a that's actually a bit of a um I don't, I don't really know what's going on there, but there's a bit of a misunderstanding. In, in Nicaea 2, it's it's Latruo and Proscuneo that yeah. they differentiate. Yeah, and that's people right. people bring in this Dulia thing, but that's not actually there in Nicaea 2, just to clarify yeah. that. E e either way, Dulia is meant to show the same concept, but otherwise, yes, Proscuneo is the word used by the used by the council itself. Yeah. Um, okay, what was Can our... Yeah, let's move on. So our next passage is... Uh, Deuteronomy 27, I believe. Yeah, so there's there's, a, there's there's quite a few little. I mean, like it's there's there's countless little things in the Bible yeah. talking about how you shouldn't, you know, venerate images. So Deuteronomy 27, he shall be cursed who makes a carved or cast metal image, which is an abomination to the Lord. Right. I mean that there's there's lots of stuff like that. But I think where it gets quite interesting is when we look at the prophets. So I've, I'm going to go. I'm going to jump to Isaiah 42, Paul. And, okay, um, no I'll just go there with you then. Uh, oh, cool. You've... I'll jump there with you. Just to have Isaiah forty two eight. Uh, yeah. It says, uh, "God does not give His glory to carved idols." Uh, yeah. Now, this is important. This is saying that because um, people are going to say, "Oh, whenever the Bible says you can't venerate images, that's talking about images of false gods." But here it's saying God Himself, the only true God, Yahweh does not give his glory to idols. Yep. So so it's saying you can't make an image of the true God. Um, in Isaiah 40, this happens again. To whom then God asks, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A, cast, a, a craftsman casts it. So again, saying you can't, God's likeness cannot be sh shown in a, in a lifeless image made by some dude. Uh, God is much bigger than that. 
And then in in, um, Jeremiah 10, uh, God says, Images are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. They are all the works of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. So again, you can't have the almighty God be resembled or reflected in some silly image painted by some guy. Mm -hmm. Um, So... The say you can't say, oh, the the Old Testament is only talking about images of false gods because God Himself is yeah is ruling that out. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And um and as I said, something I was going to make a bit more clear with Exodus was how they do this linguistic prescriptivism where they where they'll say, oh, it just says not to do it of gods. We don't consider the saint gods, saints gods. Therefore, it's okay. Um, but I wanted to make I wanted to make more clear as well as the fact that with the terms for gods, so particularly in Hebrew, Elohim, that doesn't just refer to um beings who are who who have a who have like who are like high transcendent ruling thing it's not saying what iconodules will say and you shall not worship another being as the transcendent creator god it simply says you shall not worship basically supernatural beings that's pretty much what elohim refers to because virtually any supernatural being even dead human spirits like in first samuel when the spirit of samuel is brought up it's called an elohim um and it's one of the only times in scripture that that happens so that is kind of a significant use um, and so any, any supernatural being can be referred to as an Elohim. So if you want to give like a more wooden translation, you could say you shall have no, you shall have no other beings, non-material, non-corporeal beings before me, which of course the saints in heaven, they're, they're, they can't, they, they would kind of be included in that category. So that's, that's a significant thing to consider. Something doesn't, isn't a God just because, something isn't a God or not a God just because you claim it is or is not a God. It's a God by virtue of just, just, just what it is, just just what it is. Yeah. Um, So that's an important distinction anyway. Anyway. And even if you depict, if you, if you were to try and depict Yahweh for an image that would, that would in and of itself become an idol automatically because it would be a false representation because Yahweh can't be depicted in an image. Of course, we're going to end up, you know, Jesus is the image of God and that sort of stuff, but we will get to that in due course. And to answer yep. a question there, um, yes, we are saying that that is a single principle. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's because that's an extremely common feature in, in Hebrew, in the Hebrew scriptures especially, that they'll, they'll give like couplets that say the same thing. And that actually is a critical, uh, that is actually a critical point that, fatally that that basically fatally refutes a certain key proof text that the second council and ICA uses for the latria dulia distinction or latria proscuneo distinction um but we'll get to that when we when we yeah. get to that but it's, yes it's funniest distinct- part of the council probably uh, yeah, yeah it is it really is <laughs> okay are you ready to move on to the new testament witness yep 100 percent. let's do it um okay so first of all the old testament injunctions against images are never lifted ever yep. not once the New Testament explicitly lists the injunctions about circumcision, sacrifice, eating certain meats, etc. Those are the the ones that are annulled. Uh, they they the New Testament says they're annulled. Um, and by the way, <laughs> you know, in in Acts fifteen, obviously it, it makes it very clear which ones. Um, well, I don't know. That's a tangent. Maybe we shouldn't get down to about the whole not eating blood thing. But yeah, so the the images thing is 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 not in, uh, lifted. So you can't presume that they've been lifted if the New Testament ever makes that clear. Now, the New Testament does seem to be saying the same thing as the Old Testament that God can't be depicted in an image. Uh, so Paul in Romans one twenty three says uh, he repudiates those who have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Again, if scripture is perspicuous, then we're going to read that on its perspicuous level. So what is the plain sense of that passage? You can't depict the immortal God in images. John 4, 24, Jesus himself says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The point of what Jesus is saying there is that God's worship cannot be located sort of in the physical sense. Because the Samaritan woman is saying, oh, well, you know, you worship in Jerusalem, we worship here. And Jesus is saying, you're looking at it all wrong. God is spirit. You can't worship him in this sort of local sense. And that clearly can be applied to images. Um, Like, you know, the the sort of pop level Roman Catholic devotion where if you're praying in front of a statue of Jesus, it's sort of like, 
a better prayer sort of thing. We're just ruling all that out in John 4. Okay, so and then um, here's a classic one. Acts 17, verse 29, Paul says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. That is like, <laughs> I don't really know how, how clear you need the Bible to be than that. This is oh, in the sorry. New Testament. This is saying. after Christ's ascension. And Paul is saying the divine being is not like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. <laughs> now, of course, of course, to be fair, the icon jewels they'll say, oh, we know the glory of God is not like that. We know the glory of God is incorruptible. We're just saying it's okay to depict him and all that. But what they what they don't really see is how okay, cool, you agree with that. But what scripture is saying is that it is on the basis of that principle that you cannot depict God. You cannot just create another principle that then permits it. They are actually not permitting the creation of images at all on the basis of that principle. And if you agree with that principle, if this wasn't a thing in scripture and you just had the freedom to like derive whatever principles, whatever application of principles you want, that'd be one thing. Fact is though, the scripture does say, don't make images because the glory of God does not rest it is, is is incomparable to um to mortal corruptible images and so th that's the principle that's what you got to play by the scripture gives the principles but also gives in many aspects in many areas especially this one it gives the application and according to scripture the application of the principle that god's glory cannot be reflected in corruptible images is therefore don't make images of god and so nicaea too fundamentally just says um obviously inadvertently, but they fundamentally say, mm, nah, that application is wrong. We're going to make a new application. That's fundamentally what it does. Yeah. yeah. And remember, like we said at the beginning, we are presupposing the sufficiency of scripture. That's right. So if these are the only texts in scripture that talk about images and they are always negative, so let's repeat that. Every single time scripture talks about images or the veneration of images, it's negative in the New Testament and the Old Testament, and we're going to presuppose that scripture is sufficient, that's, it. that's the answer. Um, if you're going to say, oh, no, 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 actually, you can do this, blah, blah, blah. well, scripture never said that you can, and every time it talked about this issue, it said you can't. So, yeah. Yep. Okay, Acts 14, Paul encourages his listeners to turn from these worthless things to the living God. The implication, again, being the living God cannot be depicted in a worthless image. So that's that about images. The New Testament has almost nothing to say about images. That We literally have quoted the only times the New Testament ever yeah. talked about. It. There are other times the New Testament talks about idols. You know, it repeatedly says turn from idols. You know, In John's letter, he says children turn away from idols. But people are going to say, oh, idols, that means false gods. Um, so we've decided to not go into those. But even without going into those, our case is still strong. Yeah. But now we get to the really, I think, probably a better argument than this stuff is what the new testament says about venerating apostles and angels so in acts 10 25 to 26 we read this when peter entered peter the apostle peter cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and venerated him the greek verb there is proskuneson proskuneo venerate mm -hmm. venerate guys not worship venerate but Peter lifted him up, saying, stand up, I too am a man. Peter refuses mm. Cornelius's veneration, and he, uh, he chastises him for it. He says, you cannot venerate me. Now, hold on a minute. If you, oh, actually, before, let, me, let me get to the next one first, and I'll make my point. All the right. other one is Revelation 19.10. So John himself, he falls um, down at the feet of an angel. Um, I fell down at his feet to venerate, again, the Greek word there. In this case, the, the um, case it's in is uh, proskuneisai, but again, the root is proskuneo. Uh, I fell down at his, feet, at his feet to venerate him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Venerate God. Hmm. Here's our point. There's if a Greek right here. If veneration is forbidden to be shown to angels and apostles in person, 
why on earth could you venerate an image of them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, as Nicaea II themselves would say, an image is still, is still a subordinate thing. It's still only a type that's subordinate to the archetype. And so even if, if the archetype itself cannot be venerated in this religious context, then what about the mere type that derives yeah. from that? What do you do and with that? We've been talking so far mainly about the idea of images of God, but remember, and for me, this is the biggest issue. Nicaea too says you can venerate images of apostles and angels, not just God. So you can kiss a painting of St. Paul. You can kiss a painting of St. Peter. You can piss, um, kiss <laughs> a, a painting uh... of angels. You can bow before them. Uh, but we have these cases, th these texts right here, where it's saying you can't do that even in person. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any any sense that <laughs> I just... So what's Peter going to say to Cornelius? Cornelius, no, 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 you can't venerate me. That's very, very bad. Just wait till I'm dead, paint a little painting of me, and then you can venerate that painting, Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Uh, that's so true. I think, I think, um, yeah, I think that's exactly what they actually said. Uh, that's exactly what they said. Wait till I'm dead. Then you can venerate my image. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I'm not worthy of veneration. God, no. But uh, artistic. And, and let someone say, oh, yeah, you can venerate them if they're dead because they're like glorified in heaven. No. Revelation 19.10. John is in heaven in yep. Revelation 19.10. He tries yep. to venerate an angel while in heaven. And the angel says, you must not do that. Venerate God. And I do remember, um, not sure, I'm not sure actually if Nicaea 2 itself uses the exact wording, but I do remember clearly John of Damascus or some others mentioning how, and, and Orthodox more generally, referring to how icons are a window into heaven, you know. Um, and so here's John in heaven. <laughs> 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 it's you yeah, I, I i actually am struggling to understand how you could how like what arguments someone could make here yeah. i i don't i i really i can't see it um That's right. yep. a little question there someone said why did john think it'd be okay to bow down to being not sure just angels are obviously pretty cool so yeah yeah probably probably just a general thing i think it may be similar to like what happened with daniel when the same thing happened daniel fell and he was like petrified before the before the angel that appeared to him. I think that'd just be a natural reaction. Like, oh man, whoa, just, oh man, please don't do anything. And then the angel's like, calm down, bro. I'm not God, just stand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so something pretty simple. Um, that. Without that out of the way, I'm ready to move on to the Deutero canon, if you are, Paul. I am as well, just uh, terrible. Sorry, you know what? Actually, I'm going to pull it. Uh, do I have it with me? I kind of forgot to, you know, really quickly, I'm going to get my, my English Septuagint ready. Okay. Um, I'll just read the verse the verse anyway. So it's um, while I wait for you to get it up. So Actually, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll have it in just a second. Let me pull it up okay. because the passage itself, the, uh, the greater passage is highly, highly, highly significant. Okay. Um, while you do that, I just want to say we don't yep. think Deuterocanon is inspired scripture to the same degree as the 66 books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, I follow the Anglican formularies in believing that the Deuterocanon should be read. I do read it. It's in my lectionary. So I, it's part of my um, daily office that I do. But I don't see it as being um, God-breathed uh, like the rest of Scripture is. Um, that's, I think that's probably a... a I'm not going to get into why I think that right now. <laughs> it's just a, not really relevant. But the point is... The people who are defending, the kind of people who defend the veneration of images are the kind of people who believe the Deuterocanon canon is scripture. Okay. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to use their books against that's them. It. That's yeah. it. That's it. And, and ironically, I mentioned this to River as well. The um, Deuterocanonical passage uh, from Wisdom of Solomon. So Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 is ironically the most explicit of the proto and Deuterocanonical witnesses um with respect to specifically applying to apart from the second commandment perhaps um but specifically um rebutting key assumptions of iconodulia um mm -hmm. particularly particularly their assumption we'll, we'll get there we'll read it and you guys will probably recognize it as we read just it. very sorry I, I misspoke there's 66 in the whole bible there's 34 in the um hebrew canon yeah <laughs> base yeah. 66 book hebrew canon yeah. <laughs> oh river, river made a mistake there with this his whole case 
presentation destroyed. Expect uh, expect yeah. William Albrecht to spend an hour on this uh, on this uh, issue. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. So I'm starting off with wisdom of um, wisdom of Solomon, chapter fourteen, starting from verse eight, and I'm using the Brenton Septuagint uh, with the English translation, and it says, "But that which is made with hands is cursed, as well as as well as uh, as sorry, as well it as he that made it." He, because he made it, and it, because being corruptible, it was called God. Now, one key thing, one key thing for iconodules is that um, they will often claim, "Oh, look, the Bible says talks about how the pagans actually considered these idols gods themselves, and we don't consider the images to be the saints themselves, so it's not the same thing." Um, which very clearly ignores how the Bible acknowledges that there's a distinction between the images and the gods, and that the pagans don't actually believe that the image itself was literally the God itself, but rather ironically, just like the Iconodules, a very direct and divine um, demonstration or image or type of the God itself. But what's mm -hmm. important is that wisdom itself actually explicitly acknowledges the distinction and still denies it. So continuing on um, for the ungodly and his ungodliness are both alike hateful unto God for that, which is made shall be punished together with him that made it. Therefore, even upon the idols of the Gentiles shall there be a visitation, because in the creature of God they are become an abomination, and stumbling blocks to the souls of men, and a snare to the feet of the unwise. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication, um, or in the Greek it literally just says fornication, but potentially may refer to that, and the invention of them the corruption of life. For neither were they from the, from the beginning, neither shall they be forever." Notice that it actually appeals to that principle, why it's bad, why it's corrupt, because they were not there at the beginning and they won't be there at the end. The mere fa fact that they're corruptible means that these images as objects of whatever devotion you call it is a bad thing in itself. Um, so, yeah, uh, for any of were for by the vain glory of men, they entered into the world and therefore shall they come shortly to an end for a father afflicted with an untimely mourning when he hath made an image of the child soon taken away. Now honored him as a God, which was then a dead man and delivered to those who were under him ceremonies and sacrifices. That sounds a lot like certain practices today, if you tell me. Thus, in process of time, an ungodly custom grown strong was kept as a law and graven images were worshipped by the commandments of kings, whom men could not honor. Now, here's the key thing. Yeah. In the That's commandments clear. of kings, whom men could not honor in presence because they dwelt far off, they took the counterfeit of his visage from far and made an express image of a king whom they honored to the end that by this, their forwardness, they might flatter him that was absent as if he were present. Also, the singular diligence of the artificer did help to set forward the ignorant to more superstition. For he, peradventure willing to please one in authority, forced all his skill to make the resemblance of the best fashion. And so the multitude, allured by the grace of the work, took him now for a god, which a little before was bought honored as a man. And this was an occasion to deceive the world for men serving either calamity or tyranny to describe under stones and stocks the incommunicable name. Let's go back again to verse cool. uh, 8, 17. Can um, I read one because I just maybe it might be helpful to hear a different translation. Yep. Uh, so uh, when people could not honor monarchs, this is the NRSV. When mm -hmm. people could not honor monarchs in their presence, since they lived at a distance, they imagined their appearance far away and made a visible image of the king whom they honored so that by their zeal, they might flatter the absent one as though present. This is um, condemning that. Okay, yeah. So, like, this is in condemnation of that. And that is most explicitly what Iconodulia is trying to do. It's trying to honor God who is not corporeally present among us today through an image that acts as a window to heaven. And yet here's Wisdom of Solomon saying, don't do that. And remember, Revelation nineteen and X ten says you can't have you can't do that in person anyway. Yeah, with a, with um, a prophet like Peter or an angel like um, the yeah the angel that visited uh, John. So, so then yeah, and then verse eighteen. Then the ambition of the artisan impelled even those who did not know the king to intensify their worship, for he perhaps wishing to please his ruler skillfully forced the likeness to take a more beautiful form. And the multitude, attracted by the charm of his work, now regard as an object of worship the one whom shortly before they had honored as a human being. And this became a hidden trapped trap for humankind. Guys, this is quite obviously what happens with images. Okay, so yeah. let's take Mary, for instance. She was a Middle Eastern poor girl, like 13 years old. 
when she was um, pregnant with our Lord, right? And how does she get depicted? Absolutely stunningly gorgeous, the fairest white skin you could imagine, <laughs> luscious blonde hair, a halo above her head, wearing silk clothes of blue and white. <laughs> like, that's what's going on, right? And and, and this is it's saying that when you do that, you are you basically are just in, in inciting or enticing people to worship it. And you can't tell you can't tell us that's not what we see in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox world. I've seen people lying prostrate before images of Mary, before statues yep. of her. And I look at the statue and I'm sort of thinking, I highly doubt Mary looked like that statue. <laughs> for starters. And it's just, oh, this is this is what happens. Mm. Uh, I went on a mission trip to India. Um, it was quite a few years ago now. I think it was in 2017. Um, and uh, the part of India we we're in, there was lots of Roman Catholics. And man, the 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 image worship was unlike anything I've ever seen before. I mean, obviously the, the Hindus would do it too to their to their demon gods, but. Um, the Catholics as well would it, it would almost be kind of kind of funny. So you'd have this this uh, representation of some demon on one side of the street for for the Hindu Hindu demons, and then on the other side of the road, like it would often happen this way: you'd have boom a statue of of a Catholic saint, and and the, the same sort of veneration the the Hindus would show to their demon images, um, the Catholics would show to the statues of the saints, uh, but it would always be depicted you know, in stunning form, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just... It, it is a funny observation. It really is a funny observation. And and I think the the abuse just somehow goes even further because sometimes I'll even say, oh, we're not, we're not trying to do this. We don't want to do that. Um, but then they do that anyway. And a good example, I'm Sean Barsa here with his comment reminded me of it. I can understand venerating images of Christ. Well, hopefully after this, you can understand not doing that now because as the logic of scripture itself says, this is the immortal God and you're putting him in a corruptible form. Don't do that. Um, thank you. For the Father James. Yes. Yes. None, Romanists. Nonetheless. Yes. Yes. Romanists, not Catholics. Yep. hundred percent. That's, that's, that's in my head. Um, nonetheless, in terms of a relative hierarchy of sensibility, sure. Let's say venerating images of Christ. That's the, that's the least objectionable of otherwise a set of objectionable stuff. Um, they tend to lose me when Catholics say you can venerate images of the saints and angels, as well as images of God, the father, that last one, is the one that really tells me, especially with orthodoxy, because there are, you can find a good deal of images of God, the father himself. Mm -hmm. And yet when you look at their own principles as throughout their own writings, including Nicaea to itself, that is absolutely forbidden because they will themselves, particularly John of Damascus, he will strongly emphasize how, um, oh, look, Israel, they didn't see God because he was God, the father. No one has seen him. That's why they couldn't depict him, um, which is a misinterpretation of that Deuteronomy passage, but whatever. Um, and then he says, but now with Christ becoming incarnate, um, he became in flesh. He became in material. Therefore, we can depict him and we and we really should and give veneration to it. And then, but then we can say, okay, cool. Let's grant that silliness. God the Father, you still haven't seen him. No one has seen the Father and live. They grant that. They actually grant that. Nicaea 2 itself in their acts say that. No one has seen the Father and lived. And that's why, in addition, they'll actually try to argue, and we'll get into that, um, they'll try to argue that in making in making images of Christ, they're only depicting his human nature and not his divine nature, which is like, uh, yeah, Nestorian alert. But either way, um, they're, they're deliberately trying to say, we're not trying to depict the divine nature, let alone the father, right? And yet you'll see today icons of the father, not just little image icons, but under the dome of churches, you will see icons of God, the father. Yeah, I saw the Sunday, I saw a statue of this, I don't know who it was. I mean, can someone tell me? It was this guy with this big um, white beard. Hmm, that's kind of weird. And he mm. was holding up his. He was holding up Jesus, hold like holding him up. So Jesus is sort of crucified, and this guy with a big beard is holding him up. And then at Jesus' mm. feet is a dove. Why? Why was there a dove at Jesus' mm. feet? Who could that be? Who could that be? Oh, um, that, no, no, that must have been Zeus. It must have been Zeus. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but so you know. I, I, this, this isn't in just, just in India. So, um, there's a, there's a Roman Catholic gift shop where, near where I live. And I went there and they sell crucifixes where there's God, the father clearly, cause he's got a big beard, um, holding up his son. And then there's a, and there's a dove by his feet. So this is a depiction of the Trinity. I saw this on Facebook the other day, a friend of mine on Facebook posted an image 
saying, um, this is, I don't know if you've seen this, Paul, because it, it kind of, I saw a few people post it. It said, when you're, um, when you're taking the Eucharist, this is what you see. And it's like people at church taking communion. And then it says, this is what's actually happening. And then it's like, everyone's in heaven taking communion. But there's, um, there's Jesus on a throne. And there's this guy with a big beard. I wonder who that is sitting next to him. And then in between them is a dove. So that's, that's a depiction of this of the first and third persons of the Trinity. Even Nicaea too says that's unacceptable, but it still happens anyway. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. And we can see why, because their own their own logic, their own reasons, like on top of the fact that their whole theology is built on just so stories to try and explain away the passages, their reasoning for trying to get away from the implication of okay, so you're depicting the divine nature now is built upon even further just so stories, and we will. Uh, get to that more. And uh, JK says, remember, there are no historical sources in the first 300 years of the church for history, teaching of fathers or the apostles supporting veneration of icons of any kind, um, at best only for teaching. And that is 100% yeah. true. Um, almost certainly even further than 300, probably closer to 400, maybe 500 years. I haven't looked at every single source, but uh, the practice does very clearly arise very, very late. Tangentially related, is Paul super strict on 2CV stuff, actors portraying Jesus in TVs, movies, or no, no? No, I'm not. Um, or is he more chill and only unhappy with images of idols of God meant for worship as veneration? Pretty much that. Pretty much that. I'm, I'm absolutely against veneration images. Otherwise, as I showed at the beginning, I have this beautiful image of the Lord's Prayer in Greek with, of course, an icon of the Lord himself. I don't venerate it, but it is always there on my desk to remind me of my master who I serve, who to whom I must, do, uh, must uh, render the glory to in everything that I do. It's a fantastic reminder in that respect, but I do not treat the image as if I treat him. And that is ultimately why scripture will make statements like making the image into a God, not because the pagans actually believed the images themselves were a living God. They clearly didn't. And neither did the Bible think that the pagans think that these images were actually the God in its essence itself, but rather you're treating it like it as, as wisdom of Solomon itself said. And I believe Isaiah as well, they're treating it as a God because they are rendering service. They are rendering devotion that would normally occur to living beings and you are rendering it to an image. <laughs> Father James, Mr. Priest, do you want to say that? I have an image of your mum, Paul. <laughs> do you want to say that, mate? <laughs> do you want to say <laughs> Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, dear. Ironically, as soon as you ask an EO why icons <clears throat> don't look realistic, they'll respond with something like their theological depictions. So there goes Nicaea 2's line of reading. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's actually kind of a good point as well. They um. The Eastern art style of icons is deliberately meant to be more flat and less realistic in order to emphasize a kind of uh, divine, kind of ethereal uh, aspect. Yeah, but it also shows the sort of um, ethnic and cultural obsession of the Eastern Orthodox world where even, yeah. even to this day, they're still obsessed with the Byzantine art style. Like, mm. and it, it's, it's... I think it's a good art style, but... Yeah, it, it's cool, but it's like... It's there is this clear sort of nostalgia for the Byzantine Empire that is replete mm. through Eastern Orthodoxy to an almost idolatrous degree, where they're putting this sort of this time period and, and art styles on such a pedestal that it's actually kind of I don't know, I just find it kind of bizarre. Um, yeah, yeah. someone says, What's your stance on cultural depictions of Christ as Asian and Asian church as African? Um, I don't know about you, Paul. I, um, I'm opposed to that. I think that goes wow. against Christology. Jesus was an actual man. He actually lived. He was an mm. actual Jewish man. He wasn't right. sort of, um, yeah, it's, no, if, I, you, right. if you say, oh, we're going to depict him as an African-American or something, you're going against the incarnational nature of mm. the incarnation. Right. And also remember what Jesus did on the cross only makes sense within the within the context of him being Jewish, of him being the in, the the true Israelite, the true Jew, the true son That's of true. Abraham. Um, yeah. But I don't know, Paul. You might you might not have that same view. I'm normally I'm normally fine with it because I actually do I do think sometimes in such art it can emphasize the true universality of Christ the man um, in in the in the in the universal scale of his ministry. But otherwise. Um, those issues you brought up, I think they're fair points. I think they're ultimately prudential um, in particular. But otherwise, I'd ask you, ignoring my own position, I'd ask you curiously, um, would you say that's still a sin in, say, before the modern era, before um, people in China, for example, or North Africa or wherever, or even in Europe, people, they didn't even know what a what a Judean looks like. And then they just depict Jesus 
um, to look like what yeah, that's, the that's people that they've always seen. That'd be that'd yeah, be that kind of fine. that's fine. Yeah. It's just just something that I would prefer to avoid. And and usually these days, when you go to like some woke Episcopalian cathedral and there's like a black Jesus, there usually is some sort of yeah. pernicious. Yeah, the the, the, the intention behind that, that is what that 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 is an idol I would smash. I would actually smack that if I had the, if I had yeah. the opportunity. Um, Five James asks thoughts on practices such as kissing the scriptures. I kiss my Bible and prayer book. Um. I, I don't know. I, I'd probably take a pass on that. I'd probably kiss the Bible. I wouldn't kiss the prayer book unless it included yeah. the Bible in it. Yeah. Um, I, I'd be I'd be of the same thought. Like, I'm not totally sure of that, but I'm to err on the safe side of caution. I wouldn't do it. Um, but for anyone who may think that there might be an inconsistency in us, we'd, I'd, I'd personally simply say that images, of images they're simply graven images. They, they, they do not possess, um, they do not, God is not there at all in an image. And they do not reflect his true divine nature, which is ultimately where our worship is directed. That is why the worship of images is wrong. Whereas the scripture, this, this book right here, the scripture, ignoring the apocrypha parts, so let's cut that off. The scripture is the word of God. It really is there. There is message. There is information in there. That is truly the inspired word of God. Um, and so even though I err on the safe side of caution, um, that one fact, nonetheless, I think, would make in a relative sense the case for venerating quote unquote scripture much more viable than graven images. Yeah. And that's by the way, I just point. want to clarify what I said. I I don't I don't kiss the Bible and I, I, yeah, I, I, neither, I neither. I'm just saying it's sort of like I wouldn't I wouldn't be too bothered. I wouldn't start protesting outside your house if you did that. <laughs> yeah. As as opposed to your Orthodox or Catholic friends who do venerate images, yeah. you you protest I get my <laughs> sign. <laughs> <laughs> Proscano does not equal <laughs> Latro or something. Should we, should we get to should we go to Nicaea 2? Let's do that. All right. Okay. Um, so, yes, Nicaea 2. They have, they have more or less two, maybe three core arguments. Would you like to outline them before we go in deep? Yeah. So, there's, we're going we're gonna to look at these, the cherubim in the temple. My cherubim. My cherubim. <laughs> <laughs> Must make. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look at that they look at that then they're going to do the the big uh proscano is different to, to letruo so you can venerate and doesn't mean worship um so that's a big one and um and then there's just some other sort of like silly arguments like that we'll get to about how the church can't err and that's <laughs> that sort yeah. of thing that's where it gets What's really a- weird especially in the refutation in session six of the acts of the council of nicaea and again for anyone who's interested if you want to study this topic absolutely essential that you pick this up this is the only um the first and only complete english translation of all the acts of the second council of nicaea only recently came out um by father richard price absolutely essential you need to get it um but yeah session six in particular with the claims of like the indefectibility of the church like oh you're going against the catholic church and the fathers and the tradition of the church yeah they, like in there in session <laughs> six <laughs> sorry it's question begging it's like the church can't err and it's like uh-huh which church is that <laughs> Ooh, wait 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 <laughs> and it's like and, and it's like um it, it's, it's in session six when they refute um when they refute the primary statement of the council of Hieria, which occurred a few decades earlier and that council which was also big at least 300 bishops in that so virtually equally as big as nicaea too um that council condemned images it was full on iconoclastic so it condemned the veneration of images and really just existence of images proper um, so session six was largely dedicated to going through point by point in that statement from the council here area and refuting it. And as I was reading through it for researching for this, it's like, my word, it, this council, the guys who wrote it, I can see where the author bros get their, get their hubris from and their language. Like you just read it and it's just line after line of just bloviated. Oh, they're, they're going against the church. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is actually really funny when you read it. I just could not stop when I read through that. I just could not stop thinking of people like Jay Dyer or Brother <laughs> Augustine, or just any of the major author apologists who are like really, really loud mouth. There's really respectable, awesome ones like shout out to Craig Trulia, Sarah from Hamilton, and, and a few others as well. But otherwise, the real popular loudmouth author bros, that's just brought them right to mind. I'm like, okay, I see where you guys get this from. But yeah. Lots of bloviated statements about the indefectibility of the church. No, no bother trying to actually demonstrate that they are the true church that is indefectible. 
uh, let let alone give meaning give meaningful demonstration of that of that truth and not just quoting scriptures and saying oh look that supports us as when they just take one script that says one thing and then put like 12 layers of assumptions on that and then get to their position it's it's, it's really fascinating yeah. um but that was the challenge with my own research for this issue was that Nicaea 2 is very sparse with their treatment of scripture and by that, I don't mean that they never quote scripture. They, they quote and allude to scripture very often. But when it comes to actual direct treatment of scripture on the topic itself, it is very rare, very, very rare. And much more often, they will go into citations from the church fathers, including forgeries, but whatever, um, in order to argue oh, that the they supported their yeah. position or that he area was wrong for citing a certain father. That was where a much more of the argument was focused. Otherwise, scripture really took a back seat in the Second Council of Nicaea. Um, and with that, and it's not and, and it's not a surprise, Rich, Father Richard Price actually says the same thing. So the, this book includes both the full translation, but also Father Richard Price's own commentary. And the stuff he says, he's a, he's a Roman Catholic priest, a Roman Catholic priest in good standing. And the stuff he says about the council is like, is this like a Protestant writing this stuff? He says some really scathing comments about the council. Um, but he himself says, near the introduction in a section titled The Status of Images, he himself actually says this, quote, we shall be disappointed if we look in the Acts or in any early iconophile literature for a precise definition and coherent doctrine of why and how images are to be venerated. Certainly a number of themes are presented in the course of Nicaea II that deserve a place in any developed doctrine of the status of images, but what dominates in iconophile writing from the 7th till 9th century was apologetics that took up that took up any argument and any patris and patristic citation that served the cause, even if the result lacked both completeness and consistency um so that that's one of the that's a conclusion i've come to come to as well reading yeah. um any and all relevant sections in the acts that deal with the theology of images it's very sparse and the most you learn is pretty much just whatever is relevant for the current apologetic claim like um the the he area claims that the icon of that when the iconophiles say we only depict the man of christ and not his divine nature and then the he area rightly in my opinion accuses them of nestorianism uh, then the council will try to explain how it's not but frankly even that was really incoherent um it's it, it's it's really ad hoc their theology that the council builds for images is very ad hoc just whatever defends their practice that they like that they personally like they'll come up with some kind of theological explanation not one that was genuinely reasoned at before in my opinion but just whatever serves to defend their whatever their position is now um, that's my key takeaway. Yeah, really and how they form their arguments. Just to say something, um, uh, a lot of people will their their pushback would be because um, people who believe that Nicaea two is infallible and mm. Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox are sort of duty bound to believe that they'll yeah. say, "Oh, well, the, the, the what's infallible about Nicaea two isn't the sessions, the reasoning, the arguments. It's the it's the dogmatic pronouncement. It's like." Hold on. It's, if a dogmatic pronouncement is based upon utter nonsense, like yes. laugh out loud, hilarious levels of nonsense, then how can you say that the conclusion's infallible? It doesn't. Yeah. It just, yeah. That's it. That that's exactly that was my utter shock when I read that in um, William Ott in his Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. He says that exact same thing, where yeah. he says the infallibility of a papal ex cathedra pronouncement is not in the reasons he gives. That's not infallible. Um, just in the pronouncement itself. And so, so I myself even said um, to, a cer to, a cer to a certain Romanist friend, uh, I, I myself straight up said, okay, so in your system, the, the Pope could say, um, okay, you must believe in, I, I forgot what example I gave, but let's just say you must believe Mary is co-mediatrix or whatever. That's the dogmatic pronouncement. And then, but then his reasoning for that, that he gives in the encyclical is pee pee poo poo, I do do do. <laughs> and he says that for the reasoning, and that's okay. That can be yeah. just total gibberish nonsense, but that apparently is okay. That can be fallible. Does that make any sense? And you see how you see how this view of like the magisterium therefore forces people to completely surrender critical thinking and logic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they expect us to to just abide by what they're saying, even though the, even if the logic is just utter nonsense. So what? Why did God give us gifts of logic and critical thinking to begin with? 
if actually, oh no, you just have to believe everything the man at the big hat says. Does it? Yep. It just. Yep, that's it. And not even just that, but even if he gives utter nonsense for its reasoning, you must submit to it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Should we go? Should we get an IC or two then? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, just quick. I want to quickly answer a question. Someone said uh, positions about Eucharistic veneration. Oh. Um, I believe in the reformed view of the spiritual world presence. So the the Christ's body and blood is not locally present in the bread and wine, but present yep. in the hearts of the worthy recipients. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing to, to venerate. Um, right. Now, I'm not sure. I'm, I haven't thought about whether this would apply to the Calvinist um, spiritual presence position, to put it crudely. Um, but I do genuinely think otherwise that for any other real presence, like full-on real presence doctrine, um, particularly transubstantiation, but even the more mystery TM view of like orthodoxy and certain Anglo-Catholics like Father James, I personally can't see how any opposition to Eucharistic adoration can be maintained at all. If Christ really is there, he's here. He's he, you pick up this you pick up this wafer. This is Christ right here. Is there? How could you how could you then refuse adoration? Um, um, not, not, not like not like not ad adore him at any given moment, but just. How could you say in any way in principle that adoring that Eucharist is wrong if Christ is really present in one of those strong real presence views? I think I think the reason is because Jesus says take eat, not look at, venerate, and then eat. Sure, but he doesn't he doesn't also say like take like he doesn't say every single thing that is to be done or can be done, if that makes sense. Like he doesn't say, um, for example, give to the priest to give to the deacon and then take from the deacon's hand, for example, even though that's a normal oh, practice. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, even just yeah. on the principle, I don't see why in a, in a, in a more strong real presence view that Christ, that the, that the elements couldn't be adored properly. So sure. that, that's my take with that. Um, um, Corey, <laughs> don't forget Corey, the author bros. You Westerners I, believe in logic. <laughs> yeah. The, the bread is the mode is sort of, is, is in some sense, the mode of reception. So like the, the bread is consecrated yeah. and becomes a symbol and sign of Christ's body. So we pointed it and said, and we can say you, you, the priest can say, this is the body of Christ because it has been consecrated and set apart as That's a it. sacrament. But the, but the presence of Christ's body and blood is in the hearts of the believers. That's what yeah. all the reformed confessions say. All right. Should we get to Nicaea two? No problem. No problem. Uh, all right. can be, yeah, that's that's kind of my point. That's not like Jesus. Yeah, he didn't give it yeah. for adoration, but that's just that's kind of my point. So Father James agrees, adoration can be done. Um, but yeah, that's just all I was saying. Like anyone who opposes, who believes in the real presence, but opposes Eucharistic adoration, I don't believe that yeah. can be consistently done at all. Oh, anyway, um, Delton, see it too. Um, Delton, the answer is yes. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so now you too. Let's get to the Marcherubim. Ah, yes, Mocherubim. Okay, so God does uh, direct Moses to and to tell the, the carpenters and stuff to construct images of the cherubim and the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then he and then also Solomon does the same thing in First Kings with the Temple of Jerusalem. So you do have images of cherubim. You have images of other stuff too. Um, that there are there are carved images of animals and plants in the temple and the tabernacle. And then the other one is the bronze serpent in the wilderness where God tells Moses to construct this bronze um, serpent, put on a stick so that people can look at it and be healed from their, um, from their snake bites. Although I, I actually, um, uh, I think that maybe those weren't even snakes. They may have been dragons, but that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> so what's the issue here? Well, first of all, we need to have a proper hermeneutic, a proper way of interpreting scripture. Remember how we said scripture is sufficient and perspicuous. As part of that, what we're going to say is general and universal commandments trump specific commandments. Okay, so um, that, that makes sense, right? So if God says, you know, this is the general law that you all need to follow, but then there's specific circumstances where he seems to sort of work around that. You can't say that the specific case, oh, that's like the normative one and not the general one. Okay, so because the second commandment says thou shall not create an image and bow before it, yep. you can't say this general universal second commandment is now what doesn't no void. anymore yep. because of the fact that God told Moses and Solomon to make an image in a temple. 
It doesn't make any sense. And remember, this is completely dodging the issue. The issue is veneration, as Paul and I have said for the last hour and a half, as I've made very clear in the article I wrote, it's not the images themselves. It's the veneration of them. I've got a great biography of Luther I'm reading here. Look, there's a painting of Luther. It's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> am I going to kiss this painting of Luther? Am I going to light incense before it? Am I going to bow before it? No. St. Luther or a pro nobis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, again, the issue is veneration. Now, what's, what's important to note is that we find out in 2 Kings 18 that the Israelites actually started to worship the bronze serpent. They, they had kept it from, from back in the day, and they had put it up, and they started worshiping it. And King Hezekiah, and he did a noble... Hezekiah. Sorry? Who's Hezekiah? <laughs> oh, well, how, do, how do you say it? Hezekiah. Hezekiah, <laughs> Hezekiah sorry. Yeah. Hezekiah. I actually don't think I've ever heard someone out loud say it, so Hezekiah. Or, but you could do it. I don't know. Well, that's good uh, going. <laughs> King Hezekiah, he um, broke it in pieces um, because because of the fact that they're venerating it. So that that refutes that that case is is now closed. It is refuted. Yep. Hezekiah smashed it. He broke it in pieces to avoid the veneration. The issue is veneration. So the, the, what we're saying is God clearly did not intend people would venerate these things. And God expected the Israelites to know better. The Israelites to know that there is only one God, and that is Yahweh, and he can't be depicted in the image. And so he'd expect the priests and the high priest who go into the Holy of Holies when they see the cherubim to not start venerating them because yeah. clearly the high priest knows that that's not the point. Yes. Um, that's, right. that's right. Yeah. And that's why... Um... That's that's why ultimately the Council of Frankfurt's position is the most consistent because to to to, to acknowledge again, Nicaea two was dealing with fallen iconoclasts, so that was a genuine issue. The fact that they would deny images at all, but even then, an iconoclast could still make the argument, like Tertullian, he he would make the argument that um, the the idea of special dispensations by God to make certain images does not overthrow the rule that would prohibit all images. And I'd agree, I disagree with Tertullian and he area that all images were banned. Um, but otherwise, <clears throat> with the Frank Council of Frankfurt, their position is much more much more consistent. Where making images, it's fine for various purposes. Veneration slash worship slash adoration, yeah, no, nah, that's bad. That's that's very bad. Don't do that. Don't do that. Hmm. I, I think River is making a distinction between positive law commands to Israel and natural law ten commandments. Would you agree with that? Or yeah, but sure. But the point is, the point is, you can make an image. So we're not say, we're not yeah. like we're actually not juxtaposing these things. This yeah, the point we're making. This is really important to understand. For me and Paul, the cherubim issue and the second commandment don't contradict each other. There's no yeah, contradiction. No. But for but what I hear Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox people say is they actually juxtapose them. They're like, oh yeah, well, you know, God said that, but but what about the what about the cherubim? And I'm like, what are you saying? Are you telling yeah, me there's do, contradiction? Do you, do you do you guys actually believe that the second commandment forbade yeah. all images at all? So now that, I'm just going to call their bluff. Okay, now you guys have a problem too. How do you solve a contradiction in scripture like that? Yeah, you've <laughs> made scripture contradict itself just so that yeah. you can prove that Nicaea 2 wasn't wrong. Yeah, gee, <laughs> gee, where have I heard that before? Romanists and Orthodox making yeah. scripture contradict itself. Hmm. hmm. And remember the 39 <laughs> articles, for instance, say, you know, you can't make one place of scripture repugnant to another. Yeah. And I, I just think, I think it's so indicative of how, how pernicious this mentality is of, council has been infallible when in a desperate attempt to prove that the council wasn't hilariously wrong you have to end up making the word of god contradictory like That's if right. you've done that there's there's like much bigger issues than your veneration of images <laughs> your whole your whole theological system has pretty massive problems um yeah okay 100 percent. 100 percent. um no, I'm, I'm not yeah i'm not yeah i'm saying there isn't a contradiction there is no yeah. contradiction. We're saying that the other side is saying there's a contradiction. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. All right. So now really the the key of it, really the core yeah. of it all, veneration versus worship, a distinction without a difference. <laughs> so nice here too says the Greek word proskuneo, the Greek verb proskuneo means to venerate or to revere. And they say that this is okay to be shown to creatures. And uh, that latruo uh, means to worship, 
and it's reserved only for God. Okay, we've already said hilariously, absolutely hilariously, like God, I genuinely thank God for doing this. In Exodus 20, verse 5, <laughs> when our Lord God says, Thou shalt not bow before them or serve them in the Septuagint, which is the Bible that Nicaea 2 recognizes and Roman yeah. Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. He uses the two words. He says, you shall not show proskuneo towards them or letrua. <laughs> so, um, so even if there's a distinction, even if there's a distinction, God still in the second commandment rules out both. So... I mean, we're st we're gonna we Paul and I are gonna now try and prove that there isn't a distinction. But but even even before we we prove that there is no distinction, it doesn't matter because both are in the second commandment. So yeah. um, uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely terrible. So I'm trying to find a key section in Nicaea two where they give like it's one of the key core statements on the veneration. I want to read it because that'll be the key foil really to respond to. Um, so just while I'm doing that really quickly, if there's more stuff you can kind of fill her in. Yeah, sure. And also I love this comment here. Who would you follow, Chad King, Charlemagne, or White Witch? <laughs> Irene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for those who don't know, Irene was the pseudo-empress who presided of Nicaea II. She um, actually cut out the eyes of her son and murdered him so that she could become empress. <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, not very oh, funny. But disgusting. And um, the the uh, bishops that she appointed were her lackeys, who she appointed just so that they could um, approve her position. And Charlemagne, yeah, that's the Holy Roman em Emperor, who was the rightful Roman Emperor. He um, rejected Nicaea too. Um, hence why it's not ecumenical, because it was rejected by the West. Okay, so back to the whole um, silly distinction. Uh, first of all, in Scripture... The, in the New Testament, the standard word for worship is proskuneo. There's heaps of examples of that. And a good one would be uh, John 4, when Jesus says true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. He uses the verb proskuneo. Uh, so we're not really seeing this idea the New Testament is saying there's like this sort of, what, you got worship, you got kind of veneration. Like, yeah. like well, how are you going to translate that? True venerators will venerate God. I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't really fit. <laughs> um, now we've uh, we've already talked about Acts ten and Revelation nineteen. So uh, um, the Apostle Peter, you know, of course, uh, Pope the Pope, Pope Peter, and um, and an angel both forbid veneration proskuneo to be shown towards them. They use that word. So 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 Nicaea two has immediately fallen apart. They say you can show proskuneo to an image of an apostle, but then the Pope Peter himself says you can't. Right. Okay, now here's where it gets really hilarious. So you might be thinking, wow, yeah, Exodus 20, Acts 10, Revelation 19. Clearly you can't show veneration to someone, so why on earth did Nicaea 2 think this? Surely they had some scriptural backing for it. Well, you know, apparently they did. One verse, right. one verse in the Bible is is what, is what they use to, to say there's a distinction. Oh, sorry, hold on, just before I get to that. There are some other ones, like for instance, there are some cases where civic veneration is shown so people show proskuneo to like pharaoh for instance that sort of thing we've already said there's a distinction between civic and right. uh, religious okay um cool now here's the here's this hilarious verse in luke 4 8 jesus um quotes from deuteronomy 6 13 but he doesn't you know he doesn't exactly quote it you know uh, what's that word they call paul when you kind of um not paraphrasing but you're kind of it's like it wasn't a paraphrase it, it, it's interesting because maybe whether jesus remembered like a different manuscript tradition or if he just like kind of slightly glossed it um which is yeah, normal it, which yeah. is, it, it, it wasn't a full gloss because it was very it was very much a quote but it just included some extra words to like emphasize this point and that's not jesus twisting the scriptures to make it say something it didn't say no, in the context of what was happening he was rebutting satan to who was yeah. saying worship me and um, the original passage just said, um, you shall fear the Lord your God and him you shall serve. But Jesus says, um, you shall honor the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. And um, for, for the purpose of the passage, Christ just emphasized uh, something in the passage that otherwise is already there because that passage is right in the middle of something saying, don't worship other gods. 
So perfectly acceptable use. But, and I found the text I was looking for that uses that passage, um, specifically the Matthew version of it. And so this is their reasoning they use from the passage and where it gets really hilarious, uh, that river that river mentions with respect to textual issues. So it says, um, St. Saint, uh, Saint Anastasios, Bishop of the uh, Theopolis, and this is in session four, by the way, um, page 301 in the Price Edition, uh, Bishop of Theop Theopolis, a uh, letter to a scholasticos in which he sent him an answer to a problem raised by him and which begins, to him who has asked for wisdom alone, wisdom will be credited, and he continues further down. And may no one take offense at the term veneration, for we venerate human beings and holy angels, but we do not worship them. This is the summary explanation of their position. For Moses said, you shall venerate the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. Note how in the case of you shall worship, he added alone, but made no such addition to you shall venerate. So it is permitted to venerate for veneration is an expression of honor, but in no way to worship nor therefore to address prayer. While one may indeed say this is in relation to the first term, the second term is still subject to the opinions of many having not yet received an esoteric reading. Now, here's the hilarious thing. Did you want to say it or did I? Because it's, it's, it's a big hilarious point. I <laughs> uh, no, you, you can go for it. All right, all right. Here's what's really funny. That they rely on specifically on Jesus' gloss in the passage. And that specific reading of you shall venerate um, proskynesis, or proskineo, um, the Lord your God, and him alone, so him monon, alone, you shall worship. That is only in Jesus' own gloss, which again, given the context of the original passage, perfectly acceptable gloss, it's only there and in Codex Alexandrinus. I'm not aware of any other manuscripts. Maybe there are some others, but as far as I'm aware, virtually all the other manuscripts, both of the Septuagint and in the Hebrew itself, do not have alone. So the passage does not say, him alone shall you worship, which is key because as the council itself just said, that is where they are. That's where they are hinging their distinction of largely Adulia veneration in this passage on. They are hinging it on the idea that one action is said, you shall do it to God. And the other one, you shall only do it to God. As if to say the former action you can do to other things. And yet the original passage itself in the Septuagint does not have, and in the Hebrew text does not have alone. And yeah. then in addition to that, the original word in both, well, both in the Hebrew, but also in the Septuagint, again, vast majority um, manuscript tradition, um, does not use proskuneo for the first action. It uses um, foveo, fear. So you shall fear the Lord your God. So it's not even using their word for veneration there. And so on both those counts, but in particular the first one, where it lacks the adverb upon which they hinge their whole case for this passage, not there in the original text, only in Jesus' gloss. Again, Acceptable gloss for his purposes, but for this passage where they are hinging it on a specific word being present in the text, not there. Falls apart. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't. Um, even even this, even leaving that aside, even leaving that aside, just think about how bizarre it is to say this. So, so Jesus, this is what he says: "You shall venerate the Lord your God, and Him only you shall worship." Like, isn't that kind of just? That the plain sense reading, the same saying, thing. It's saying the same it's thing. The same thing. Like, it's everywhere in he. It's everywhere in the Hebrew scriptures. You say the same thing twice. Like, people like, from you know, now on, I have to be really careful about this. That if I, yeah. if I, if I don't say only before something, they're gonna think that I can. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. So like it. Oh. <laughs> it's it shows that the council just does not understand a basic feature of the Old Testament of parallelism where it will repeat something yeah. twice, but it's saying fundamentally the same thing, even if it's two kind of different aspects otherwise of the same thing. Um, and the parallelism becomes more obvious and their attempt to make a, like a separation of the two things eviscerated when you see the original text doesn't even have an adverb upon which they can even make a technical case for separating the two actions. Um, and so with the adverb gone, it's much, it's even easier to see, um, even though it is already easy to see, that it's just two things saying the same thing. It's saying the same thing ultimately. It's not hey, like someone, it's, oh, it's them inserting their Greek analytic understanding where two things are said. So maybe there's like a technical distinction and all that when it's actually mm -hmm. not there. Someone says, how do you know it's not in the original text? We're talking the, the, the quotes from Deuteronomy 6.13. So you can just read the Septuagint there. Yep. 
you can read um what you call you can you can read the any Septuagint edition you'll almost any Septuagint edition I believe you'll find that uses critical data uh, maybe the Brenton Septuagint I'm not 100 percent sure um, but otherwise um, manuscript data is very much clear on this and Jesus's own gloss and Codex Alexandrinus are the only exceptions I am aware of maybe there's others out there um, but as far as I've researched that is quite certainly the original reading. It doesn't have the adverb only in the original passage um, and the and the less important point, but otherwise it doesn't use the word proskuneo. Um, and that's and the the Hebrew text itself that we do have makes that even more clearer. Though the, that's yeah. the case the, the same as well in the Hebrew. Uh, to answer Billy Protestant or J Father James's question. So I haven't, I have to be honest, I haven't put a whole lot of thought into this, but the point is that scripture does seem to be making distinction. So where there are cases where people show proskuneo to Pharaoh and to other people of high civic authority. Yep. But then in Acts 10, Peter says, don't, don't show proskuneo to me. And in Acts 19, the angel says, don't show proskuneo to me. So there, there, is, there seems to be a scriptural distinction. Um, I, I think that that will require some more reflection on my part to yep. sort of maybe figure out exactly what's going on there. But, but a point that I should have made, I forgot, is even then... Um, the, when Nicaea 2 says, look, they show veneration here, they show veneration here. Not one of the cases they bring forward of venerating an image. So, for instance, I believe that when you see King Charles III, um, you, should, you should bow, you should bow before him, right? But if you look at a painting of King Charles III, I don't think you should bow before that. That's kind of weird, right? Uh, <laughs> right. So even then, the, the, the whole image thing is, um, yeah, the, it, it's sort of just besides the point when Nicaea 2 brings that up. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what is the reason that St. Peter and the angels say not to do so? So St. Peter doesn't, um, I, I, sorry, let me, let me get it up. I just want to make this clear because this is a really important point. So, uh, Peter says, Peter simply says, stand up. I too am a man. And then, um, the, the angel one revelation 19 is clearer. So the angel says, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you. Um, venerate God. So the point is, yeah, they're creatures. Uh, they're not God. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. I, I personally, I personally do have a thesis. Um, uh, I'm building like a personal thesis that tries to do an, uh, a comprehensive framework of worship in Holy Scripture, and I'm kind of along those conclusions as well. Where civil authorities and that they have a certain inherent authority given to them by God um, and status and that, which does permit for, and, and really in, in a certain way requires, uh, a, a honor and respect showed to them, uh, visibly when you're in their presence. But then with respect to angels and that, um, unlike earthly Kings who were given uh, a sort of vice regency under God and the earth, God has absolutely and totally claimed the heavens for himself. And then, and so any, any devotion or veneration or whatever of heavenly beings is not is not permitted. Um, that's that's right. something I'm going to bring about afterwards. And um, also, Garrett said, um, Charles the Third isn't perfect in Christ. We don't worship saints. Um, irrelevant. In Revelation 19, right. the angel forbids veneration to be shown to him, and he's in yeah. heaven when that happens. Proscuneo. He forbids, yeah. he forbids John to proscuneo, to bow before him. In as heaven. orthodoxy does the images. Yeah. Um, okay, should we move on to the so, sort of more theological yeah. takes of Nicaea too? Sure, they, here's an important What about the veneration of the tabernacle? It was decorated with images. Again, images, we said this a lot in this stream. We're not against images. We're not. There's there's veneration, there's veneration itself, but then you're talking about veneration of the tabernacle. We're gonna need a passage of that. Like, what do you mean veneration of the tabernacle? Like, how was it venerated? If you can pull up a specific passage, that'd be nice. And it wasn't um, the I, can tell you, I can tell you personally from the get-go, the difference would be that God is actually there. He's in the he's he was there in the tabernacle himself, yeah. and not um, in the images. Great difference. The, the point of the tabernacle, by the way, is that God says He's enthroned between the cherubim. So in the throne of heaven, He's got cherubim around Him. So when the tabernacle has cherubim, it's sort of making that point. So they're not they're not, they're not venerating the image of the cherubim. They're venerating yeah. the, the presence. Yeah. Of the, Let alone, as far as I'm aware, the tabernacle itself. It's just they're, they're in the tabernacle. They're offering, they're doing their honor and their veneration because God is literally there. He's in the tabernacle. Yeah. So that that's actually sensible. Okay, yeah, thought so. Joshua 7, 6. So I'm going to pull that up really quickly for us because this is another proof text, I believe, Nicaea 2. And Iconodules more generally do refer to. 
Um, so, okay, so Joshua 7, 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. So yeah, not the tabernacle itself, but the ark of the covenant. Um, and he's falling before the ark of the Lord because the Lord is literally there. Like he's the, actually yeah. there. Yeah, it's not whole, simply an image. It's not a graven image. It, he is there. It is his vessel. Um, so that's that's the great, great difference. And even Nicaea too admits in the passage, I forgot the exact passage, but they will explicitly say, that God is in his essence is not in images. We're not pretending, we're not wanting to give Latria to the images because God in his image, in his essence is not there. Um, which is kind of kind of funny because they say we're not giving Latria to the images, only venerating him, and that passes on to God. But then um, I believe Hieria itself gives the logic, uh, gives the ref the rebuttal of like, um, well, if it passes from the type to the archetype, why can't you give Latria to the image? And indeed, apparently the Theodore the Studite, um, Who's a who's a later Orthodox saint from a bit after the council? Um, Father Price actually explicitly cites him as basically saying, "Yeah, you can give Latria to an image of Christ because the the it passes from the image to the archetype." And so you have the Council of Nicaea two saying one thing, and you have other certain saints saying something totally different. So, which just further shows they didn't really have a full coherent um, uh, theology of images. Thank you guys for doing the stream. I disagree, but it's handy having the best arguments against mine in one place. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I do intend to explore this again in the future, particularly with a specific uh, critique of John of Damascus's uh, writings on this because he gives a bit more detail than the council, funnily enough. Yeah, this is top stuff. Thank you very much. Anyway, um, moving on. Okay, so here's where we, like, I feel like we, we, we've, all, in this video, we've already addressed the, the, the meaty, the meaty stuff. There's now just a few little little arguments here and there that we need to deal with, and each of them is pretty simple. We're just going to crush them um, with our pinkies because they're yep. just really silly. Um, so, for instance, in session six, the yep. council quotes Zechariah, uh, the prophet Zechariah, who says, uh, was, I, was I pronouncing that right, Paul? Um, yes, you were, this time. Uh, cool. uh, who <laughs> says um, that... Uh, in the coming age, God will free Israel from the worship of idols. And this, so, okay, just are you ready? get ready for this. This is big, guys. This is really big. Yeah, this is really big. <laughs> this is going to blow your socks off. Do you want me to read the passage? <laughs> huh? Do you want me to no, read the passage? I'll read my comedic version. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Zechariah says, in the future, God will free Israel from idols. And then Nicaea too says, you see, <laughs> worshipping images isn't idolatry because we've been freed from it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't even know where to begin. I, I... <laughs> hey guys, what am I doing here? I'm sitting at the poker machine and wasting my, my my mortgage on the poker machine. Guys, I'm not gambling. My psychologist said that I'm going to be free of gambling anytime soon. It's okay. I'm not gambling. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's... Yeah. Oh. Even that example is not as funny because this, the, the person said that to you, but it's like... It's like Zechariah said that about the true Israel. Ugh. And yeah, if you guys are doing idolatry, then I guess that just means that that prophecy yeah. wasn't about you, you fam. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not. Clearly not. Oh my word. And this is actually a really popular iconophile argument in the time, both from the council and from John of Damascus, who says the same thing. Oh, Israel is prone to idols, but we Christians, we're cool. Um, we, we, we're not doing idolatry. So just... Just slap some dually on it and it's okay. It's all fine. <laughs> and remember, the early church didn't venerate images at all. So yep. it, this is a new thing. This is an innovation. That's right. Uh, I just, I almost feel like we don't need to talk about that anymore. That is just, it is, that's what we mean by hilariously bad. Uh, just, wow. Yeah, it, wow. It, it really, it really is funny. Like, it's just... <laughs> The, the the logic just goes right out of there. Yeah, you, you can imagine all these all these like bishops who are appointed by the empress just being like, oh yeah 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 yeah, you know, <laughs> just but like without any oh, critical. Man. Yeah, surely so there was some Israel not this his mind was like thinking this is kind of weird, you know. But he looked around and everyone's nodding their head, so he's like. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so did the true Israel not exist between the time of the ecumenical acceptance of the council and the reformation? Well, that's actually one of the key problems. When was there an ecumenical acceptance? Like there was opposition to it and even a lack of knowledge for it for centuries. Um, Father Richard Price refers to archaeological data in the East where um, both official lists of ecumenical councils um, in the East and certain inscriptions listing out ecumenical councils, um, well, what just what the ecumenical councils are, that they actually lacked the, any reference to Nicaea too, likely because they just didn't even know it was happening, possibly because of the Islamic invasions. Um, but and, and we can tell that because in certain inscription lists of the ecumenical councils, they're all in Greek and they're from a certain period. And then suddenly there's like a later Latin inscription that mentions Nicaea too. Um, so when there was ecumenical acceptance, that's really not an easy question to answer at all. There was opposition for centuries, both opposition and lack of knowledge and therefore lack of acceptance for centuries after it even happened, let alone the explicit opposition of the Franks for a very, very, very long time. Um, not to mention um, even if certain higher-ups, even if many of the higher-ups accepted it, there may well still be local opposition. Not something I've comprehensively studied, so I, I can't say it, but but then again, I think even this statement shows um, that more study needs should be done on your part, like to actually address, okay, what actually was the statement? Was there an ecumenical acceptance at all? If so, when? How do we define that? Um, but yeah, no, I'd say that the true Israel resides even if God preserves one congregation, there is the true Israel. That's yeah. how God works. He raises the dead. He, he turns dry bones into living people. He raises the dead. Um, and so even if the vast majority of a so-called institution, of an institution that likes to call itself the church, even if it goes wrong, um, God will always preserve his elect somewhere, somehow. Um, that's not going to falsify the faith at all. Yeah. So that's what I'd say about that. Um, uh, yeah. What else? Yes. Back to the silly stuff. So um, <laughs> the, the the clown the clown stuff. Yeah, we have. Um, oh yeah, it cites Song of Songs. It says so. Song of Songs. Um, the quote is: "Show me your face and make me hear your voice, because your voice is sweet and your face is lovely." And then it goes, "Ah, I see. You need images. Uh, they're they're necessary to convey, um, you know, p someone's person." So since uh, the Bible isn't a picture book, we need to make pictures <laughs> that can see Jesus. But it's like the Song of Solomon's verse isn't about isn't about pictures, fam. It's about real it's life. Like and that's that's actually a key distinction because none of these images from I I don't have any reason to believe that any of these images are based on a direct eyewitness account of just what Jesus looked like. You can make a pretty good guess. You can make a pretty good guess of what he looks like with certain ethnic generalities. But otherwise, as far as I'm aware, they're not based on an eyewitness account, except if you go for the absolute meme story of like, oh, uh, what was it, Basil or whoever had an image of Mary painted by Luke himself or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. But, or, 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 the, or, the, or the alleged history of um, the King of Edessa receiving a direct icon of Christ from mm. Christ or, or one of the apostles. Um, I think one of the apostles, yes. But yeah, um, specifically they say the council with respect to the Song of Solomon, um, they say, we all see and understand that both before and after the Holy Councils, the painting of images was handed down in the church just as the reading of the gospel was. Like, fact, just, just, just false. Just, just straight up false. Like, not true. Um, for it is when instructed, for it is when instructed in our ears by the reading that we transmit what we have heard to our minds and it is when we see representations and images that we likewise perceive them mentally and so through these two things that accompany each other i mean reading and painting we attain knowledge of a single thing through being reminded of what had been done in the past now stepping back that's true images can be a great help in that respect they, that can be for this reason we can find the operation of these two principal senses can join the song of songs when it says show me your face and make me hear your voice because your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. It is in agreement with this that we too sight recite in the psalm, as we have heard, so we have we seen. This being so, it is appropriate to say that those who blathered against the sacred images, each one has spoken vainly to his neighbor, his lips are deceitful, blahdy, 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 blah, 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 iconoclast back. Yeah. Now, something very important is that we can look, I, I, I grant images are great, images are helpful, they can be very, very helpful. Even then, the iconoclast can very easily and, and rightfully respond. What are these passages talking about? They are talking about the perception of the actual thing itself. Show me your face, not show me, not show me a, a artistic rendition of your face and like an, an imitation of your voice. Show me your face, show me your voice, actually see it in the flesh, 
hear it. That is precisely why we say that the veneration or just the worship of images, because we don't we don't grant that your thing is just a lesser permissible veneration, is wrong because it doesn't accurately represent the immortal, incorruptible God. That's precisely yeah. why we deny this veneration. And so I want to make a point here. Um, okay, this is this is actually a really important point that we haven't that we haven't made so far, um, but it it really is quite crucial. Um, if you venerate an image of Jesus, that image necessarily has to be depicting him in in his human um, state. I mean, he's still human, obviously, when he was incarnate here on Earth two thousand years ago. Yep. The reason why is because this is what scripture says about Jesus as he is right now. Second uh, Corinthians 5.16 says, we no longer regard Jesus from a human point of view. First Timothy 6.16 says, Jesus dwells in unapproachable light. First John 3.2 says, we are yet to see Jesus as he is. And then whenever Jesus appears to people post uh, ascension, it's blindingly bright light, like, you know, Paul in, in Damascus and in Revelation. Okay, so you can't depict, you can't depict Jesus as he is now. So when you see a depiction of him, this is how he was before. Here's the issue. So that means that, you know how they say, okay, so we need to have an image of Jesus so that we can see him as he is, quoting Song of Songs. Yeah. I was like, well, that's not what he looks that's like. Nice. And so what he you're actually into the is the form of a servant is for a time. Go back in time. You're having, to, you're having to venerate Jesus as he was 2,000 years ago. And so your faith stops being a living faith in a man who's here right now, he's alive now, and it becomes you venerating this this guy who lived two thousand years ago back then, did, did, or at least the form he was in two thousand years ago. Yeah, 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 the form he was in. Two, yeah, does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's um it's kind of bizarre, and it's this is actually a pitfall, by the way, that we as Christians can very often fall into. Let's say you want to devotionally reflect on Jesus, and you and what you do is you, you sort of you think about what he did in the gospels and stuff. And that's great. But if you only do that, Jesus starts to become this historical figure who sort of isn't around anymore. A good moral teacher. Yeah. You know? Um, anyway, there you go. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, now... So that was bizarre. And then, uh, oh, did he have something to say? Because I was going to talk about how what they do with Matthew 16, 18. That, that they thing. um I was gonna I was gonna mention because with that point it's very closely related with how the council itself claims that they are not depicting God according to his divine nature. So I'm gonna read from it itself in the in session six where they say the name <laughs> Christ uh, signifies Godhead and manhood, the two perfect natures of the Savior. And Christians were taught to paint his image according to the nature that had been seen, but not according to the nature that was invisible. For this is infinite, for no one has ever seen God as we have heard in the gospel. So when Christ is painted in his human nature, it is obvious as the truth himself revealed that Christians acknowledge that the visible image shares with the archetype only the name and not the essence. And so then you can very much rightly, very rightly ask, are uh, the Storianism much? You, you, you're going into that? Why are you why are you pretending to draw a hard wedge when you're depicting Christ? They are presumably trying to depict Christ at least in some kind of representation of him in his earthly ministry. So are they now saying that Christ the man didn't have a divine nature? Is that what they're saying? Mm. Are they are they are they really going to say this pictorial image of a man it doesn't depict a divine nature at all? What happened to the hypostatic union? God man in flesh, as much God as he is man. What are you saying when you say that you're just depicting him in human nature, not his divine, because the divine yeah. is invisible. There's truth to that. Yes, the divine is invisible, and that makes our case when you go consistently with it. But now you're claiming that you don't... What? What? Mm. Anyway. Uh, sorry, um, just in the comments there, so someone someone said, uh, I can't believe my mom keeps... No, no. <laughs> I'm not saying you can't have images of what Jesus was like in, his, in life here on Earth. Yeah, we're not just saying that. that. Like, the point is... Um, it says here, he says, we do have images of the end times with Jesus in glory. I'm saying you can't do that. Scripture says you can't. You cannot see him as he is. He dwells in unapproachable light. Yeah. Um, not, and not that, uh, yeah. not that you just can't make any kind of image depiction for like, I don't know, educational purposes. Yeah. But you're treating it as an image that is the type to the archetype. 
when yeah. that is a when that is a logic that scripture explicitly forbids. That's the problem. Yeah. And so yes, you can have images of Jesus in his incarnate world showing you one he has himself, which we don't have an issue with. The point is if if the only thing that you're gonna venerate of Jesus is gonna be depicting how he was two thousand years ago, yeah. it, it will lead to this sort of it will lead to a fact where you kind of look to Jesus as he was 2000 years ago and you sort of aren't looking to him so much as he is now. As, yeah. If that, if that makes sense, it's just, it's just the end, the, it puts a sort of weird emphasis on things. And yeah, my overall it. point was that it was wrong to quote song of songs to do that. They yeah. say, Oh, song of songs. So therefore we need to have an image, an image of Jesus so that we can sort of connect with him as he is now. And we're saying you can't depict Jesus as he is now. So you can't make the so they kind of made that point. That's that's all I was saying. Yep. Yep. That's it. That's it. Right. Then they quote Matthew 16, 18. Oh, here we go. <laughs> the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. And they say, there you go. We have to be right because the church can't fail. Uh, sorry. Uh, before I do that, Father James, do you look to Jesus how he's in the gospel? Yes. Yes, I do. The point is you can't only do that. That's, that's my own. That's all I'm saying. Can't only do that. Um, right now, <laughs> when they say, "Oh, look, the church can't fail," therefore <laughs> we can't fail. It's like, yeah. Well, one, we think you have failed, so uh oh, maybe you're not the church. <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you're going to say the well, church, well. Um, but point is, we don't um, we don't interpret that verse yeah. to mean the uh visible church uh is infallible uh we don't interpret that way so yeah pretty much yeah. it's just it's just a big argument sorry i hope you're not hearing that weed whacker in the background or um yeah but um there's yeah someone mowing whatever but um yeah it, it, just, it just shows that it's a big thing of presumption we we presume that we are the true church and that we will never err and so oh look whatever this thing says about bad things and erring, if it says we can't err, we, we can't do it at all. So we can, we can do functionally what they, they functionally, they may, they may not like it functionally what they're saying. We can do whatever we want, but because of these promises said in scripture that must apply to us, it, it mustn't be that sin. So functionally, if they wanted to, again, they'd probably deny this, but that's, but I couldn't say how you could logically deny it. They could institute churchwide practice of, Let's bow down. Let's just bow down to statues of Baal and call him king of the sky. Um, oh, but that's okay. That's okay because the Bible. We're, we're just going to label it something uh, not worship. We're gonna we're gonna call it Ubadulia. Okay, so it's not worship. It's not worship. It's not large. We're gonna call it Ubadulia. And as long as we can just slap another label on it, that's okay. We're not we're not violating the clear injunctions of Holy Scripture. Um, Glory for Jesus, lovely to see you, mate. I think they mean the church would be in such gross sin it would mean failure while we think the church can err badly and can be covered by the blood of Christ. Yeah, exactly. That, it that, wasn't that, widespread. The yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing. It wasn't, it wasn't, yeah. and it wasn't even a universal practice, even after the, the Council on ICO2. That's that's the that's the problem. Um, but it, it go and again it goes into what I said earlier, how they'll cite these passages on God's promises to the church, and they'll add twelve thousand layers on top of it about how. Therefore, when you convoke uh, something that's called an ecumenical council, even though it doesn't have anywhere near close to the majority of bishops across the world, let's ignore that and just call it an ecumenical council. Um, and it meets in these specific conditions. Therefore, this passage says that this is infallible in its pronouncements. And not, not in everything it says, by the way, but specifically its dogmatic pronouncements in the later Horos or the canons, whatever you want to call it. And all from a very simple passage, such as, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. All of that hyper-specific context and assertions from a much simpler passage that does not in any way entail that, it, it may be compatible with it, sure, doesn't in any way entail it, and is also equally compatible, and it's much more parsimonious anyway, to simply say that God will preserve his church without any extra implication of, the church will never err in this specific manner for all time. Never says that anywhere at all. Yeah. Um, and for what it's worth, how Luther interprets that stuff is Luther believes the invisible church cannot, yeah. cannot err. Yeah. So the, there will the always be an elect people of God are not going to fall into idolatry, but the visible church can um, fall into error. Right. Yeah. I mean, by the way, everyone, 
believes that. Yeah, everyone believes in an invisible, visible yeah. church. So, like, <laughs> so they go, the church can't err. Well, Roman Catholics believe that Protestants and Eastern Orthodox have erred. Protestants believe the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox have erred. Eastern Orthodox believe Protestants and Roman Catholics have erred. We all believe that there are people claiming to be the church who've erred, yeah. or at one time were part of the church, and now they've fallen into error. So, yeah. and and, and all- more importantly, we all acknowledge that there is a distinction between the visible institution and the elect of God, which is fundamentally what the invisible church thing is. It's simply referring to those elect of God who who God has has his good in favor on. Um, there are people, tons of people in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Eastern Orthodox churches, in Protestant denominations, who are flat out reprobate, whether explicitly or just in their hearts and they're just hiding it. And they're not going to go into the kingdom of heaven. There's tons of people in the visible institution there. And that is distinct from the invisible church, which is why, honestly, I think the terms invisible, visible church is kind of an unfortunate terminology because yeah, it's allowed authors. It's allowed authors and Romanists to say, oh, oh so, so you think there's two churches and all that? Um, yeah, someone... Oh, oh, is the distinction made it's very simple logic Jesus says that <laughs> logic. in the church there will be weeds or, or tears and wheat yeah um yeah. you know throughout the the new testament we're told that there'll be false teachers in the church so they are in the church they are an ordained in an ordained office and they're a false teacher and a reprobate so that's, that's all we're saying we're just saying like yeah. there's um a visible church and then there, within that visible church, you have the true members of the church who are actually united to Christ, and then yep. people who aren't. And what we're saying is, those people cannot err; other people can. Everyone already believes this. Yes, Roman Everyone Catholics knows. believe this. Does does do Roman Catholics believe that every bishop and cardinal and pedophile priest is part, <laughs> is actually united to Christ? No, <laughs> right. So they, that's all we're saying. Um, that's yeah. It. Oh, James says visible and visible distinction is practical. Yes, it's practical. That's it. That's it. It's a, it's a, it is a, it is a real thing. And I was just going to mention, oh, damn it. I was going to mention it was, it was an important thing about the, oh, it was about a distinction. I was going to say something. I think I'll, I'll, I'll remember in a second. Um, but here's the one. Also, you can display the unapproachable light in the effect, like in the light of the transfiguration causing the blindness of the apostles. So I don't see it. So, okay. So are you going to, are you going to make, are you going to create lights? That blind people when they see it. Hey, like, that's the right? only way you can actually display that. You're going to make blinding lights and expect the strobe congregation light. in the mass or, or the wherever. Right. Have it right, bro, with those strobe lights. <laughs> <laughs> Unironically, ironically, me at Hillsong when I was there, we were closer to demonstrating the the tra- the, the light of the Transfiguration. <laughs> As you said, the strobe lights and all that. Stuff. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh man. Oh man, yeah. yes, they're united by dead faith, not one kept by charity or hope, and will be cut off. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's our yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, the, you made a distinction right there. Yeah, and so that's why I've that's why I thought. Yeah, that, that's why I thought for a long while the visible invisible church language is kind of unfortunate because it's allowed ro- certain Romanists and Orthodox apologists to say, "Oh, you you guys split the church and all that," and then I turn around and say, particularly to the Romanists, they say, "Uh, hang on, church militant, church penitent, church triumphant." Oh no, you guys have three churches now. Rot roll raggy. Yeah. <laughs> I hear all fuck people. It's so bizarre. They say the invisible church, visible church is um distinction is Nestorian. Oh, I love it. I love it when the <laughs> diorites bring that up. <laughs> yeah, stupid, stupid Protestants. They always they they divide the church into two invisible and invisible distinction. There's clearly Nestorian, just like the the worship of the sacred heart of Jesus. It's it's totally Nestorian separating his his body from his divinity. <laughs> These people believe they, they often will criticize Eastern Orthodox bishops for being heretics. Yeah. You just the distinction, fam. Like, uh yeah. It's yeah. so funny. It's like for the ortho bro community, it's like <laughs> it's like just pick out whatever thing you don't like, and you just like you just you just spin the wheel, and it's like this is Nestorianism, this is Eutychianism, <laughs> this is Arianism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much what it is. It's a game of spin the. It's a game of like uh, like spin the wheel, and just it's just whatever per- heresy you want it to be. How big was your Hillsong Church? It was the main one. It was the central campus. Like Pastor Brian Houston was there very often um, in 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 Norwest, the main one in Sydney. So yeah, I was I was I was at the Vatican of Hillsong, if you will. Um, Hillsong Sorry. is the invisible church. That's it. So true. So true. I actually, I made still one of my best memes ever made it years ago. It was one of those expanding brain memes. And the smallest brain was like, 
The true church is invisible and made up of all believers, slightly bigger brain. The true church um, is like the Eastern Orthodox Church with direct ties to the apostles. And then bigger brain, the true church is uh, are all those united with this, with Peter and his successes and all that. And then the biggest brain, Hillsong is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, someone asked what diocese I'm, I'm a member of. Yeah, so the Church of Confessing Anglicans of New Zealand. So we yep. formed uh, about three years ago. Split from the mainstream uh, Anglican Church New Zealand because of its liberal heresy. Um, and we are affiliated with GAFCOM. So Foley Beach, the Archbishop of the ACNA, he consecrated our bishop. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and Sydney, us in the Sydney Archdiocese, we officially support you guys. Super awesome. Yeah. yeah. We're buddies. Yeah. That's it. If the purge was real, instead of killing people, would you smash icons? In other words, how reformed are you? <laughs> uh, we I, I think we would smash images depicting the Father and the Spirit because even I see it who agrees that that's heresy. Um, probably. So. I, I would, um, I'd, I'd probably just do, I'd probably just smash them all because like, you know, in a way, um, even if otherwise on its own, an image of Christ um, is not a problem. The fact that it's become an object of veneration, I believe that's kind of basically marked it for destruction because it took glory even in one instance from the almighty God. Um, so I'd probably just go around and just, just yeet them all, you know? Yeah, um, like I have icons in my home, but I would, I will say it, I would prefer a world of, where they didn't, where they weren't around. That way so many people weren't led into idolatry. Mm -hmm, um, yeah, I have yeah. my home because I trust myself not to be idolatrous about it. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, Okay, no, the blinding of the apostles is part of the pictures. The viewer doesn't need to be blinded for him to get the idea of the white light behind V is is uh is depicted as blinding. Now, just as an image, okay, we're fine with that. We're fine. We're just depicting scenes like that, depicting in like an inferior form Jesus as a, as light and all that stuff. We're cool with that. We're simply saying that for that that scripture itself denies the logic of venerating, of worshiping such images precisely because they cannot fully reflect what they're trying to reflect. And so in this case, with the present form of Jesus, him being a blinding, unapproachable light, you simply can't reflect. The closest reflection you can get that is to actually blast a flipping massive LED or like the sun into someone's face and actually blind them, which... Yeah, um, and... and, and but it, it'll, do that, I assume? They were quoting Song of Songs saying we need to have an image of Jesus so we can sort of feel close to him. So, yeah. so what's our image going to be? Just a white, like a piece of paper. Just a white piece of paper. Pretty much. Well, that's going to make me feel close to Jesus. Unironically, this right here, this white sheet, uh, maybe I just I just like shine a light behind it, but this is more accurate to Jesus' present form than this, unironically, yeah. in terms That's of just it. actual yeah. visuals, strict visual. Yeah. Obviously, this has more meaning to it. Yes, it's more useful for like imagery, education, reminders and all that. But in terms of just strict imagery, this sheet of paper is more accurate, <laughs> like unironically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like Paul, we've kind of gone through the pretty much everything worth talking about in Nicaea too. Pretty uh, much, pretty much. Do do you um do you want to ramble on about something really quickly? So I need to hit the bathroom, like just just thirty seconds, and then we'll get on to Q and A. Uh, I when when you go, I uh, will swap and and I'll do that too. Uh, yeah. So for I'll, for I'll you. Um. Yeah, so, so I, I think there's, in the chat I've seen there's a little bit of confusion about this whole, what, what we're saying about this whole blinding bright light thing. Again, we're saying that you can, um, you can depict Jesus as he was 2,000 years ago. It's good for educational purposes and for devotion. I mean, of course, we're saying you shouldn't be devoting it, but we're just saying like using their logic. But the point is... Um, in their mindset, the only thing that you're sh showing devotion to is Jesus, Jesus as he was 2,000 years ago and not how he is now, which then creates a sort of bad emphasis in your worship. You can't depict how he is now. Um, so their, their claim that we need images of Jesus to feel close to him doesn't work. All you're doing, all the image is doing is making you feel closer to Jesus as he was 2,000 years ago, not as he is now. He doesn't look like he did then. Even, even when he was resurrected here on earth, the apostles couldn't recognize him at first. Um, and, I'm, and so the comment there, I'm just saying Jesus in blinding glory is depictable and communicable. No, it's not. The, the scripture says unapproachable light. 
John 3 says we cannot see him. Um, you can't depict the undepictable. Uh, yeah. Like, for instance, when when Daniel sees a vision of God, his description of him is sort of absolutely fantastical. He mm. has rainbows and it's... Um, yeah, he, he looks like a crystal. Like he's struggling it. to and, describe what he's seeing. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. Daniel is clearly struggling to to put this into words. Um, and by that's a good. I was just thinking. Here, here's a funny point, actually, that just occurred to me. Does the Bible ever give a visual description of Jesus? No. no. Does the Bible give a visual well, description? The closest you could probably Daniel, say is the suffering servant of Isaiah, where he just looks. Crap! Like, like he looks yeah. really bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, however, Daniel gives us a very, ac- like, a very detailed description of his vision of God. Mm. But then Nicaea two says it, you wouldn't be able to depict that because that was depicting sort of. Well, we're not. Was that depict? I mean, I think that was depicting Christ, but but I haven't seen any Eastern Orthodox icon that looks like Daniel's vision. So, so why can't you depict Daniel's vision? Which is the only visual description we get of Christ, but not. I, mean, I don't know. I didn't put much form to that. It just occurred to me now. Maybe someone can pick that apart, but it does seem sort of weird to me. Um, anyway, I am. I will be back as well. No problem. No problem. And now I shall ramble. So, epic presentation. Epic presentation. People, send in your questions. Get that happening because once River is back, we are going to be hitting up the. Oh, come on, come back, come back. There we go. We are going to be hitting up the Q&A. And as usual, people, financial supporters, they get top priority for questions. So do send them in. Um, We have a good number of people watching. So I do strongly recommend that financial supporters, you go to the Discord and put your question in the supporter questions section so you can be easily picked out from among other people. Um, So uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically what's happening. I want an icon of Reverend Paul for Reverend (laughs) Barry. I'll paint you one, Father James. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I am morbidly curious to see what that would look like. <laughs> would it just be me just like just doing the pose of this and then just like a like a bottle of Pepsi like this? Like that's me. That, that's pretty much me. <laughs> Saints River and Paul or what I put on Nobis. <laughs> Can Jesus turn down his luminosity? I mean, he would have had to in certain appearances post-resurrection and that. Um, Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Uh, I'm not saying it's venerable. That's another argument. I'm just saying Jesus in a blind glory is depictable and communicable. Not truly depictable. No, it's not. It is at best by analogy. At best. Um, You can show a light by painting very bright white and yellow golden colors. Um, But that in terms of appearance is simply incomparable to the blinding light that the apostles and that would see. Um, especially if it included like rainbow colors and that, like Daniel mentioned. Anyway, um, if I see an icon of Jesus blinding the apostles at transfiguration, like the one by Theophanes, the Greek, I get the idea. His glory is blinding. It's not the same as being an apostle. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. You, but it is communicated. Yeah. You can get the idea. Um, obviously, yes. Veneration is where we have the problem um, because it doesn't accurately depict it. Um, but yes, anyway, Q and a is mentioning people. Uh, someone said Jesus is present for me. The point is, um, Scripture says that Jesus currently dwells in unapproachable light. Yeah. We have yet to see him as he is. When we when we get these depictions, like his appearance to Paul and how he is in Revelation, it's blindingly bright light. And remember, at the Transfiguration, Je- um, Jesus sort of shows the apostles his, his true form, so to speak, and it's blindingly bright light. His final uh, form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, when we're not, I mean, some, some, someone's going to say this is Nestorianism. <laughs> <laughs> we're not saying there's like a true. Yeah, no, I'm saying it too is Nestorianism. <laughs> at, and it's like separate from his humanity or something. It's just that the the finite cannot properly contain the infinite. That's right. Um, and so while Jesus's body that you could see if your own two eyes and touch and feel is is fully Jesus. Uh, there is a sense in which it can't fully contain his glory. And in heaven, um, I think that his, his glory is is there to be seen, but you can't actually mm. comprehend it. Uh, River, do a saint pose. Do a saint pose. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, well, I've got, I'll get a book. I've got Reform Dogmatics by Bavink. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll do mine as well again. And just the, um, oh, I can't do the blessing, eh? That's, um, what should my hand be doing? <laughs> oh, I'm holding a microphone. I'm a podcaster. Yeah, I'm trying to, trying to microphone exactly and the book. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's because Corey said he's going to paint icons of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. right. Don't you venerate that. <laughs> Don't you dare. Because Father James said, I want an icon and river of Paul for veneration. <laughs> the finite cannot contain the infinite. It's an explicit denial of the incarnation. Uh, we're talking about images. Like, okay, clarify. We're talking about the images. It's a depiction of images. Um, they cannot uh, represent the glory of God in its fullness. And that's why it's a, a classic patristic statement to say that while Jesus was on earth, he was also in heaven. Yes. Right, so while the Son of God was on earth, he was also in heaven. Jesus is the Logos. While he was walking around in Galilee, he was also upholding the entire cosmos. Mm -hmm. Was he doing that in his body? Yeah. Uh, like, well, yes and no. But um, Jesus can't be fully God if the finite cannot contain the... I'm really confused about what... There's clearly some sort of misunderstanding maybe about the language here. It's, uh, it's, I think it's because it, there's, a, there's a category confusion. The finite can, cannot contain the infinite thing with respect to God and the incarnation. Different issue to when we're saying with images with respect to veneration, they cannot even close depict the glory of God and thus should not be um, worshipped. That's a that's really a different category altogether. Yeah, but I, 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 I correct me if I'm wrong, Father James, but I'm pretty sure you don't believe in the extra Calvin, Calvinisticum and that might be the issue here. So... Um, I believe that Jesus's divine nature is ubiquitous and is here with me right now. In him, I live and move and have my being. But Jesus's human nature is not here right now. Mm. Jesus's human nature is confined to the right hand of the Father. Uh, but he's also um, upholding the entire cosmos and is here with me now. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Yep. Did the fullness of God dwell bodily? Yes. That's... Uh, the... Jesus, when you look at Jesus in his body, he's fully God, right? But it, it is a communication of attributes sort of issue. He's not, but he's fully God, but all of God, like, isn't isn't specifically only there. Obviously, yeah. God is also around me everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm um, no supportive of questions right now, so I guess just while... Well, I mean, the same logic of the Trinity. The, the second person Trinity of the Trinity is fully God, but is the second person of the Trinity all that God is? As in, so there's no Father and Son. No. So that's, yeah. Again, I'm not saying the second person of Trinity is finite. I'm just saying, like, you can say someone is fully something, but not only, but not like the only, I'm trying to, I'm, tr I'm struggling to find the words here, not the only something of a something. All right, divinity is contained in humanity by the category of relation, not location. If the finite can't contain the infinite means his finitude doesn't limit him, I have no issue with this. Right. I think that second part, I've got to read that again. If the finite oh, yeah, can't yeah. contain the infinite yeah. means his finitude doesn't limit him, I have no issue with this. Yeah. Jesus' well, body does not limit him. Yes, that's what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, here's, a, here's another one, and it's actually going to get into a really funny um analogy because i think river you showed me that article from uh, uh pastor joshua shooping on mm. the example of how i uh, well he showed me to it first but then i think you independently brought it up as well um of just the ridiculousness of the distinctions that iconophiles will often make um and it's in relation to this can an iconodule argue he is just venerating someone god or saints through an image but not the image itself and that therefore it's okay to do so and that that's the classic argument um both from Nicaea 2 and John of Damascus, it's really like the it's really the hinge upon which it all it all turns. Uh, maybe there's another one as well, but that's really the key thing. They are trying to say they're not venerating any images. And when you just take a step back and just look at the logic of language and human activity, by definition, they are. By definition, you are bowing towards an image. By definition, you are kissing an image. Um, by definition, you are showing worship slash veneration to that image. If you want to claim that it's that it's it's meant to be pointed towards the thing it represents, that's cool. That's fine. I don't have to challenge that logic. But you are still performing those actions to the image. 
And in response to this, um, Pastor Joshua Shooping recently made just a, a brilliant um, satire article. Absolutely brilliant. And it, it's, it's just a case study in how ridiculous the logic is. So I'm just going to read it as is. When Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox say we are not worshipping Mary and we are not worshipping icons, the tragic reality is that too many will do X but call it Y. It is like watching them pour water into a cup while they insist on saying, no, you are misled. I'm just pouring water into the space above the cup and it is only an accidental property of my pouring that goes into the cup. And really the metaphysical substance of the cup is the matter itself, not the space, qua space of the cup. And I am not pouring the water into the substance of the cup. You have been deceived into thinking I am pouring water into the cup. <laughs> All one can say to this is thy cup runneth over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it goes on further, but that's more or less the gist of it. It, it shows how the, fundamentally the iconophile case rests on word games. That's that's ultimately what it is. It is on redefining words and fundamentally gaslighting. Let's be real. That's fundamentally what it is. We're not venerating images, he says, as he bows towards an image. Yeah, and some other things to say. So okay, let's just let's take God and saints separately. First of all, can you worship God for an image? We've already said we've already made it clear that Scripture emphatically in the Old and New Testament says an image cannot depict God's likeness. Point one. Point two. God is everywhere. And John four, Jesus says you must worship Him in spirit and truth. Your worship is not located. So like, like, for me to say kissing an image of God, uh, I, I worship Him through that. Well, I may as well kiss this. I may as well kiss myself since I'm made in the image of God. <laughs> kiss yep. my reflection in the mirror. I may as well kiss this little image of Paul on the laptop there because he's made in God's image. It's just, it's 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 kind of bizarre. As for the saints, we've already made it clear that you can't venerate them anyway. Scripture says that. So why would you better venerate an image of them? And then there's Paul's point. Um, got some other questions here. Um, and... Uh, hold on. Someone an intro asked, reading recommendations on the issue. I recommend the homily on the peril of idolatry. This is found in the book of the Anglican book of homilies. I'm not sure if Joshua is an Anglican. It doesn't matter. The it, you don't have to be an Anglican to to follow it. By the way, that homily is actually almost entirely taken from a book uh, by um, Bullinger or Bullinger. I'm not sure how you is it Bullinger or Bullinger. Anyway. Bullinger. Uh, 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 right. Yeah, so that can be found online for free. Uh, if you just type in Anglican Book of Homilies, there'll be heaps of sites that have them up for free. It's the Homily on the Peril of Idolatry. That's book two. That will give you an entry level take it through scripture, through the patristic arguments, and then through why Nicaea 2 is wrong. Yeah. Um, the language is, of course, old. Um, uh, I think there might be some modernized versions that you can find. Uh, around the place. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Also, Calvin Institutes is pretty good on this. Yeah, there's that. Um, uh, and of course, um, the articles themselves on um, North American Anglican. Um, so River's own article. Again, I'm going to link it as well. River's own article on the issue where he basically gives the case he gave here, um, but I guess more in a more summarized form. And that's fundamentally what this discussion was following up on. Uh, and yep. then also article right after that by what's his name again? He did it right on the heels of yours and just added yeah, some more information. Jeffries, um, yeah, touched yeah. the historical case against it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, he gave some more specific historical data that was very significant. Um, but then also, of course, I'm a primary sources guy, so I can highly recommend first if you want to study the iconophiles, the historic iconophile positions, pick up the Acts of the Second Council of Nicaea. Father Richard Price, absolutely essential. Um, speaks and then, oh. sorry. It speaks for itself how stupid it is. It, it, it really does speak for itself. Uh, and Father Price's commentary is really like half, if not most, of what you're paying for. It's really valuable. Um, then there's also uh, St. John of Damascus's own treatises on, on images. Um, so it's technically three, but they're always often put into one big work. And you can find that online for free as well anywhere. It's pretty common, easy to find. And he, uh, he gives a much more thorough and detailed scriptural argument. It's fun He's fundamentally saying the same things as Nicaea too. But he just gives it a more detail, and so he's he's more he, he's more of a challenge to deal with, um, with respect to uh, attempted scriptural arguments. Um, so there's him, and also Theodore the Studite as well. He he writes on this as well, uh, and then also there are well, there's really the works of uh, Iconoclast and Icona Dual. Uh, sorry, Iconoclast and just and I think maybe you call it an iconist, basically people who just don't venerate, but they otherwise don't smash it. Um, so you can read. Oh, okay. I don't. I'd say the Libri Carolini, but they most of most of them aren't translated. That's actually the problem. Most of it isn't translated yet. Um, so if you can read Latin, 
cool. And then you can find a Latin edition. Um, there's that. And then really just many church files. You can find many good um, Flora Legia online and Flora Legia, meaning like a collection of quotes for a certain thing um, of various church fathers who speak against images. So you can look up quotes um, from, for example, Tertullian, from Oregon, from Melito of Sardis, from Lactantius, from trying to remember uh, Pope Gregory himself, Pope Gregory the Great. There was a specific letter where he... Um, yeah, which basically condemned the worship of images, but otherwise also said you shouldn't smash them. They could be good for education. Many, many patristic quotes you can find. Um, particularly, I recommend a certain article by John Carpenter called uh, The Early Church on the Anarchonic Spectrum. So The Early Church on the Anarchonic Spectrum by John Carpenter. That's an article you can find for free online. It's pretty good. Um, into The special value of that article is giving precise categories of different views along a spectrum from full on iconoclasm to full on iconodulia and then positions in between and then trying to rank various patristic citations along that. So very helpful article in that respect. Yeah. Um, yeah many things you can find um, alongside those. Another question. Do you think this doctrine impacts salvation? That's a, that's a, a important question and also yeah. really difficult one. Uh, I think yeah. I might give diff different answers. Maybe I, I could go first. Um, like with this, this issue is the same with lots of different issues in Christianity. So let's say heresy. A lot of people maybe unknowingly believe in a heresy. And then when they get called up on it and get shown the orthodox view, if they stubbornly persist, that's when we can say you're a heretic rather than you're just wrong. Okay, so there's a difference between people who were raised Roman Catholic and have always done this and, and, didn't, and don't know the Bible well enough to, or whatever, to know that this is wrong and people who have looked into all this and still persist in their view. Um, there will be a difference between, are you venerating only images of Jesus hmm. or are you also, are you bowing before statues of Mary? There's, I think there's a, there's a big difference. Big right. Um, if you are, someone who is showing lots of veneration or worship to images of the saints. I do believe that's idolatry. And would that impact your salvation? Uh, yeah, it would, in my view, impact your salvation. Are there people in heaven who have venerated images of saints? Yes. Um, but it's, that's what, that's why we're saying this with distinctions about how, how aware are you of what the scripture says and, and all those sorts of issues. I do, it, nevertheless, it does impoverish your faith in this life, I think. Um, yeah, that would probably be the overview of my answer. <clears throat> yeah, I more or less agree with that. Um, I'd, I'd more emphasize myself that, yeah, those who do willingly, knowing all what they do know, um, having read through, poured through the scriptures, and yet still coming across that it's okay to do all this stuff, I, they're in serious danger. I genuinely believe that. Yeah, and the other thing is I think that it's not an excuse for someone to say, yeah, yeah, but I believe Nicaea 2 is infallible, so I, I'm obliged to obey it. That's almost idolatry. As, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that's idolatry, but it's getting to a bad place as well. Because as, as we've already shown, for Nicaea 2 to be correct, Scripture has to be contradictory at, at worst, uh, and contradictory nonsensical at worst, and vague and utterly confusing at best mm -hmm. right because we, yeah. we've shown you we've shown we're not we're not lying to you guys we've shown you everything that scripture has to say about the issue and it all points in one direction and so if you're going to say actually no and i see it is infallible so that can't be the case what was what the heck is going on <laughs> so much for your word is a lamp to my feet and gives wise the simple more like your word is completely confusing and I have to rely on a council that was that's going to be held 800 years in the future from now to even know what the heck this means. So it's just, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Follow my C2 is not an excuse, is the point. <laughs> um, let's see. How is God located differently in the Ark of the Covenant versus when he is omnipresent? Yeah, it, look, it's a mystery. It's hard, to, it's hard to figure out. Okay. So we can't really know exactly how to what's going on he, like if jesus was in this room with me right now 
it's it's kind of weird because it's like on the one hand I can say you're there, on the one hand you're everywhere, and we'd want to say that you're sort of more there than here. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. We, In a special sense, we could say that he's. Locally, he is in some way present in the Ark of the Covenant in a way that is distinct and more special in particular than his omnipresence. Yeah. Now, in a Jewish in, in the Jewish mindset, it's going to be what's called the Shekinah, which I'll get to in a second. But like another example would be on the on the Mount Mount Sinai when when God says, "Take off your your shoes, for this is holy ground." So, what are we saying that like you're not in God's presence if you're not on Mount Sinai? No, that's the mistake of the Samaritans. Um, God is everywhere. As the Psalms always say, you know, if I went, if I go to the far reaches of the earth, there you are. He is everywhere. He's even in Sheol. But then yet on Mount Sinai, God says, this is holy ground. So he's obviously sort of like more there. Now for the Jews, even in the Shekinah, this idea of God's sort of presence, like the pillar of, of fire and that sort of thing. And, and um, some people might want to say the Shekinah is the Holy Spirit that also has some issues um yeah it, it's comp i don't know I, I haven't entirely i don't i don't think we actually can really fathom what how mm. that will yeah. work to be honest I, I think this is one of those issues when um when irenaeus himself says and there's a question um of something that's just that's just truly mysterious and not can't really be discerned from the scriptures it's something i would just have to leave to god and just move on um yeah. i think irenaeus is very wise in in saying that if, if mm. people if people haven't guessed already i really like irenaeus Yes, yeah, I'm here. I, I don't want to get into some sort of scholastic territory where we try and come up with some really ridiculously. Yeah, that's it. That's it. How this works. Does the husband depict God in the wedding? Is the bride's action in marriage veneration? Um, so husband... in, I'll, I'll start with this. So in, in one sense, uh, a husband depict God in the wedding. Well, I guess that well, what's the intention of those in the wedding? That's that's one thing to ask. Like, are they intending to draw that kind of type of thing? But then I guess in the acts themselves, does God does the husband depict God in the wedding? Well, in a certain sense, given that marriage is fundamentally a reflection of God's relationship to creation, Christ's relationship to the church, in a way, yes, it, that, that the husband does depict God and maybe more specifically the son in in a wedding, um, because with the nature and it's really it's really underappreciated the nature of just typology throughout our whole universe. How everything in some way reflects everything. Everything in some way reflects um, God, his nature and, and his relation to man and creation and all that stuff. And so in this in this respect, we can easily see how um, the wedding is itself a reflection of God's relationship and uniting with the church, the church uniting with his body and all that jazz. Um, and ultimately to be to be consummated with the ultimate final wedding uh, at the marriage supper of the lamb. And um, so in that sense, yeah, the husband does. Um, is the bride's action in marriage veneration um, in one way I, that's going to require a very expansive definition of veneration though, because yeah, I, just to jump in there for a second, uh, we've already acknowledged, and this is important to know that the, it, the Greek language does fail us here um, <laughs> because the, the Greek doesn't have a massive vocabulary for this. So in Greek, you've got proskuneo and, and, and um, latruo. And then on one hand, we've got people trying to bow before Peter, and he says, "Don't show me um, proskuneo." Mm. Then we've got other cases in like the Septuagint where you can show proskuneo to someone. It's it's so. This is why we've sort of made distinctions about civic, religious, romantic. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. Um, so in one sense, sure. In a very like, if we're going to make veneration just a really catch-all term for like showing respect in one way or another then okay sure that's a it's a kind of romantic um yeah kind of a romantic uh veneration one of sacred vows i guess in in one way can i kiss my wife's hand yes that's romantic can i if i go to a statue of mary and like kiss her hand no like, <laughs> you know, like it's kind of it is weird as this this is a fact of life where behavior is different in different contexts you know, you can kiss, like if I kiss um, my grandma's cheek, that's different if I kiss like a girl my age's cheek, right? Like well, worse yeah. and even younger one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like context matters there. Yep. That's so, it. Yeah, yeah. 
Dalton Blackman, this episode has been great. I've listened to a bunch of Presby videos critiquing this, but they aren't that good. But this is one of the be- this is the best I've heard so far. Very much. Thank you for that. That's right. that's what we we're intending. Because I too personally am very disappointed with many videos um, and and articles made against um, Iconodulia because they make very basic arguments that they're, 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 they're technically not wrong. Like when you go as deep as we do, they do fundamentally win out, but they don't show acknowledgement um, of the responses of the Arcana duels and their own nuances and thus how to respond to those. That's what we did with this video though. We made our basic arguments that are like very basic, like second commandment forbids it. But then we went, okay, how did Nicaea 2 and others respond to that? And then we attacked those responses. That's something that very, very few people um, unfortunately do are even are even capable of doing. So um, yeah, I'm glad we were able to be a great benefit in that um, respect. Um, someone says I read Calvin's Institutes and was underwhelmed. Um, yeah, so the problem with with Calvin's interview. He's meant second images, he says. So yeah. Yeah, he um he does go on too much about the text that obviously where they use the word idol. So he's like, oh look, this here says you can't worship idols. That means you can't worship images. And that's not really gonna fly with like a Roman Catholic who's just gonna yep. immediately just hand wave that off. No, that's about images of false gods. He doesn't really he doesn't go into Nicaea too. Yeah, so it is underwhelming. I just gave that as like an entry level. But um, you, you, I've seen that you said you're an Anglican, you're okay for reading old stuff. So definitely yes. read Homily and the Peril of Idolatry. Yep, um, it is a good one. Long, by the way, it's really long. It's like like 110 pages of like a standard size of a book. So if 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 you don't want to be reading on your screen, <laughs> then maybe um, buy a physical copy of the homilies. Yeah. And I'd recommend the best one would be Gerald Bray's um, critical edition of the homilies. Um, mm. So yeah. There you go. Okay, I think the Iconodule is free to make that same appeal to mystery when he is attacked for localizing God. I don't think that's a fair criticism. Um, now, we'd say no, because the difference is, well, you, for one, you can't just make, we, we both agree, you can't just resolve any contradiction that comes up with mystery. All right? there's, there's a point where there is a true contradiction and mystery isn't going to cut it. Um, what we're saying, though, is that there isn't, we're not, we're not saying, uh, we, don't, we don't affirm that there is information such that provides a contradiction of the presence of God, omnipresent versus locally present. We believe that such distinctions could be made and to an extent could be kind of articulated, but ultimately how that works out, there's just not enough to go by. And we and, and we ultimately do have to appeal to that. Look, as a mystery, you just leave it to God. Yeah. With this, however, we're making appeals to what God has actually said. And that mm. by what God has said, what he has revealed to us, um, Iconodulia is just cannot be sustained. And the logic that they themselves give, give combined with what God has said in scripture. So their claims about uh, only depicting the human nature and then what God says about because you can't depict, you, you can't depict the full glory of God. Images should not be venerated that as, as we argue that he says, therefore by the combination of those principles and, and others, then Icon of Julia just is not permissible at all. That's what we argue. We, 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 um, yeah, we don't think we don't think mystery can be appealed to when there is a demonstrable contradiction. Exactly, you can appeal to mystery if there's a lack God's of information. Word is mysterious. You can't appeal to mystery to go against what God said. Yes, I can't say, hey, you know how the Bible says Jesus is fully human? Oh, he's actually not. Oh, mystery. <laughs> but but yeah. you can't say, yeah. But Jesus, the Bible says Jesus is fully human and fully God. How does that make sense? Mystery, right? Yeah. Um, there you go. There you go. Um, let's see. Can y'all do a video on extra Calvinisticum? I think it's a great argument against RCC and EO position. And it's what one way over to reform you. I'm curious. How do you think that would take on Roman Catholic, extra Calvinisticum, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox views? How would you think that would go against them? Go against? Because uh, Dalton Blackman here says... Um, Extra Calvinisticum is an argument against the RCC and EO position. Position on what? On images or the UK? I presume so. Or just in general. <coughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've i touched on the extra Calvinisticum in my video on my channel about the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a there's a book. Is it called the Extra Catholicum or something? It's sort of like a like ironic, like this isn't just Calvin. This is like what the early church said would be a good book to read. Um, hey, by the way, that one. So, what about the argument from unwritten tradition passed down by the apostles? It's just not there. It's, it's yeah, not. It's just not there. Uh, this is church fathers this and is, they, like, yeah, but yeah. This also, is one of those. Oh, sorry, you keep. Sorry, you keep. I, I'm just I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just, you you can't verify. 
You can't just you just can't verify it anyway. Anyone can go along and be like, oh, this is what I was passed down to me from Peter. Anyone can say that. How can you verify it? The only way to verify what actually is apostolic is scripture. It, there is no other way to have proof, to have certainty about what is apostolic by the actual writings of the apostles themselves. But even then, the early church, we know, didn't venerate images. They just didn't. Well, I personally say that scripture functionally, for most vast majority of things, functionally is the only way to verify. But otherwise, in principle, it could be possible that there could be such um, significant, well-placed and well-timed historical documentation that could demonstrate a certain thing, which otherwise may not be explicit in scripture, did come from the apostles. Um, But otherwise, with this issue, yeah, 100%. there's, there's, There's like nothing. And not only nothing but lots of explicit testimony to the contrary for hundreds of years, um, which require a lot of just so stories and loop-de-loops to get around. And that's why I think this issue in particular is one of the most useful to cover in order to demonstrate that um, Romanist and Eastern claims of them being the true and incorrupt church is one area to really show how it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it goes against the other. Fair enough, make scriptural arguments. If there is one, it's worth responding to. I'm just saying the Icon of the Jewel isn't committed to localizing God any more than someone who holds God is present in the Ark of the Covenant is. I don't know if we... Did we say specifically the Icon of Jewels localize God in a... I don't remember saying that. I think the closest thing I could think of was just saying how the Icon of Jewels talking about like how they depict nature and not the divinity and all that yeah, stuff. We, which, like, we, we went into we, what Father James said. Oh, but yeah, prob- probably, yeah. Pro- oh, yeah, yeah, about the fine. I mean, yeah, that's what I said with that. That's like we're talking about different categories. Just because he's got um, that weird view. <laughs> we say that, yeah. If we say the fine art can't contain the infinite with respect to images, we're talking about how scripture itself says um, the glory of God simply just cannot be depicted in an incorruptible image and therefore you shouldn't uh, worship them. Um, but you see, that's different. That's the different one. All that God is Christ Jesus. Yeah. And there's yeah different categories and terminology we can use to bring that. And even then with the mystery, there is, uh, with the Trinity, there is enough gaps in certain information where we do have to appeal to ministry, mystery in that. Um, yeah. You said you might as well kiss yourself uh, as kiss anything else like an image of Christ. Yeah. Well, uh, there was that. Yeah. Because everything. Um, yeah. So, I, I think I get what they're talking about. Um, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. My, yeah. yeah you know, the, the point is God's... No, no, I, I see, I see. It wasn't about God's presence. It was that our yeah. worship to God um, is can't be localized in the sense that... So, like, the Samaritans thought that you can only worship God on on this mountain or, or that sort of thing. You know, you can't have... It's... Um, okay. So, so uh Kissing, kissing an image, right, isn't sort of any. Uh, you see, I mean, that's kind of not really an act of uh, an act of worship because God is spirit, and so we worship it in, in spirit, and not in that yep. way. Yeah. Now, and and as the Icon of Jewels explicitly say, and I see it too, the image does not contain God's essence. Um, so, in what way is he even present in an image? Like by that, this is by their own logic. It is, isn't just trying to. Um, pull a contradiction out of a lack of information. It's just, look, this is what they themselves say. So in what way are you venerating God? Um, yeah. What if we had a photograph of Jesus? What if? What if? What if? <laughs> what if a meteor came from heaven yeah. with a lost book of the Bible that says, thou shalt venerate graven images of anything? <laughs> what if? <laughs> of Jesus and you kiss it, you're, all you're doing is kissing a photograph. You're yeah. kissing a piece of paper. That's not Jesus. The other thing is, again, um, it would be cool to have the photograph. I'd put it up in my room, man. I'd look at it all the time. It'd be great. But um, that will only be giving you a depiction of him as he was 2,000 years ago, and it's not going to be depicting him as he is now, where he dwells in unapproachable light. And so eventually, over time, if you own, if all your devotion was sort of focused on the photograph, eventually... Jesus becomes uh, sort of limited to who to who he was. I mean, not that he's anyone different now, but like limited to what he got up to 2,000 years ago yep. and not how he is now. Yep. Um, no one says Jesus is present in the image. Yes, and that's the problem. 
Um, how do you respond when someone says that the council of Jerusalem was a scriptural guarantee that every other council was going to be guided by the Holy spirit and free from error? Okay. Okay. Here's how you can, here's how you can answer that. Um, let's say, okay, you know what? I'm going to grant that council of Hieria that was infallible and guided by the Holy spirit. <laughs> and Riley says, Oh, but, 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 but wasn't an ecumenical council. But, but, but wasn't a council. And then I say, okay, why, why was that not a ecumenical council infallibly guided by the Holy spirit? Oh, but, but, but because of these conditions, because it didn't have, uh, all the patriarchs or because, uh, there was this invalid kind of thing or technicality and all that. And the, yeah. particularly the key, really the key argument, I think there were a few, but the key argument that was brought against Hieria for, uh, against this ecumenicity was the fact that the five patriarchs are not present. So we can use that as just one standard that's a foil, but you can apply this to any other reason yeah. that someone may really give as to why a council was not infallibly guided by the spirit and just say, okay, so let's say any reason, but in particular, let's say the five patriarchs weren't present. Okay. Where do you get that standard? Where is that standard given by God or his inspired prophets that this is what makes a council that is infallibly guided by the Holy Spirit? Where does that standard come from? That yeah. the five patriarchs or it must be convoked by this person or by the emperor and they must they must uh, t- rub their belly and tap their head and do the hokey pokey before the council in order to make it valid. And where, where do these standards come from? Where do, Are these standards coming from God himself? Or did they develop over time? And not even Rome believes it. They just, they don't believe in that. The, the needs yeah, it's just, it's, it's just like, yeah, that, that, that's why they Rome is more capable of saving Nicaea too in their own system than orthodoxy yeah. because, um, and Father Richard Price, he like talks about this like a lot, how Nicaea too faulted here area for not having the five patriarchs present. And yet not only were the three Eastern patriarchs not present at Nicaea too, they they weren't even aware of it. The guys who were claiming to represent the three Oriental patriarchs in Nicaea too were fraudulent. Um, and so, yeah, so those three patriarchs weren't even there. It was just Constantinople and Rome. That's it at yeah. Nicaea too. So they failed by their own standard. Um, Eastern Orthodox, they have to be like, oh, uh, 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 receptionism. Uh, 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 uh. And so it was just hilarious because then the entire argument against Hieria just kind of like, it's irrelevant because what if the area was just accepted later? Who cares if the patriarchs were present or not? Yeah. But then with Rome, they're, they're much more able to save it by saying, hey, it was ratified by Rome. Bang, done. So, yeah, so yeah. what I'm going to say is that, um, so the Jerusalem Council is uh, in Scripture. <laughs> so you can't. Yeah, that's pretty much that. Pretty much that. Pretty much. happens in Scripture, that's infallible. Therefore, what happens outside of Scripture is infallible too. No. <laughs> um, also, the reason why the writings of the apostles are infallible is because they're apostles. Jesus has given them yeah, the, charism, the charism of infallibility. Um, so since the apostles presided over the Jerusalem Council and they have the charism of infallibility, it will be infallible. But the apostles are dead now. And where does scripture say that that charism continues? Also, this whole ecumenical council thing, is, is, as well as what Paul's already said, it's just, it, it gets really ridiculous. So, okay. It, it, someone says, ecumenical councils are infallible. I'm going to go, oh, okay, does that include Trent? Because Roman says that's an ecumenical council. Yep. They'll go, no, no, no. R- Trent wasn't an ecumenical council. Oh, how come? Because it didn't represent the whole church. Okay. Uh, says who? Like, who's the whole church? Yep. And here's, here's an example. By the way, I believe in the Council of Chalcedon, folks. I do believe in it. I do believe in the Chalcedonian definition. Just want to make that clear. However, point is, the Oriental Orthodox Church didn't assent to Chalcedon, right? So why should we say the Oriental Orthodox Church didn't represent the church, and so therefore Chalcedon can still be ecumenical, even though this massive chunk didn't agree to it, but oh, then, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why they're not part of the church. We can't say that the we can't say that Trent's ecumenical because the Protestants didn't assent to it. So why are you saying the Protestants are part of the church and not Chelsea? And I'll eventually, tell you, I'll, why- tell you, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why the Orientals don't count as part of the church for denying Chelsea. They're not part of the church because they deny Chelsea. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. Uh, the Chelsea does represent the whole church because those guys who denied it, they're not part of the church. So here's another thing. This is why I keep dealing with in light of my articles. People say, you have to assent to the church. The church is infallible. All I have to do is, is do this. Okay, church is infallible. Yeah. Uh, who's that? Is that the Mormons? Church of the Latter-day Saints? Uh, yeah. they, have they have living apostles. I'm going to go with them. And so they'll go, they'll go, oh, no, no, no. You have to assent to the church. The church is the church of the councils, so the seven ecumenical councils. All you have to do is do this. Says who? Why? 
and they'll go, the church says so. So, okay, so the church is who the church says the church is. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the Oriental Orthodox Church aren't part of the church because the church says so. But the Protestants are part of the church and therefore trans not ecumenical because the ch church says so. <laughs> it just has reasons. It, mystery, <laughs> mystery, mystery, gives mystery. And by the way, this is why I have to be honest. If you're going to say the church is infallible, you have to go to Rome. It's the only way that this can make sense. Because at least so. Rome can just appeal to the Pope. At least yeah. Rome can say, yeah, because the Pope says so. So in Rome, the church is who the Pope says says the church is. That makes sense. But I don't believe in it. I completely don't believe in it. But it actually makes sense. Yeah, consistent. At least you've got, you've got actually some kind of workable definition rather than the church is just this floating little concept that defines itself. That's, <laughs> that's why you have to go to Rome for this. And yeah. people, how many Roman Catholics do we meet who became Roman Catholic because they realized this? This is the logical conclusion. Um, but I don't believe in I don't believe the church is infallible anyway, mm. so I don't have to go to Rome with all this nonsense. Yeah, that's it. Another issue with the Eastern system is that they basically were all present at Florence, so now they're committed to agreeing with us. I've heard about that. I'd love to explore that more because that does sound interesting how there were Eastern bishops at Florence. It does sound pretty funny. Oh, um, did the Damascene get any good responses against him in his own time? I'm not sure. I don't know of anyone who directly responded to him. At best, maybe the second iconophile council, which happened in the ninth century, I want to say. Yeah. Or eighth? No, ninth century. It was ninth century. Um, maybe they responded to him, but I'm not sure how much of that we have left. So, uh, all right. Hit me up. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely hit you up for the information on the council of East and that. Um, da, 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 da. What else was there? Do we have. Not sure if we have anything else. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. This, that looks like... Yeah, yeah, hours anyway. Oh, here we go. Is it okay to burn Bibles if they're venerated? Oh, no. I to burn Bibles. No, it's it's the word of God. Um, because on one hand, an image is just an image. It's just it's, it's, it's a tool that we can use, whereas the word of God is the word of God. And so I'd say even if it is improperly used, like, again, I'm, just, I'm, I'm like River, I'm on the fence about kissing Bibles and all that stuff. And I'm only on the fence of it um, because on one hand the seriousness of the arguments against images is that they don't rep perfectly represent God. Therefore they should not be worshiped and all that. Um, so there is that on the other hand, a Bible isn't an image of God. It's not even trying to be an image of God. It actually is the word of God. And there's, yeah, so there's something yeah. real to it. Unlike a mere representational image. I just uh, want to, so that's why I'm on the fence with it, but I still want to less on the safe side. Oh, sorry. I keep talking. Over. Uh, yeah, I, heard, I heard Jay Dyer talk about this and he's like, Oh, you know, Protestants are inconsistent. Blah, blah, blah. So yes, know. Paul just said the Bible is the word of God. Yes, yeah. it is. But we're not saying that like God is sort of like contained in this book or, <laughs> or something. It is just it is just some pages of ink on it. Yes. Like, we are and saying that. That, that still that would object. make me err uh, with caution against venerating or uh, yeah. the Bible and all that. But, but when nonetheless, even if it was venerated, even if it. I was against that, and it was venerated, I still wouldn't burn a Bible because it's still the it's still the word of God with that. Yeah, Whereas and the intention is like the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I think Father James said something else up here as well, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, not sure. I think that might be might be it from now. Oh, here we go. What is your opinion on the nature of hell? Personally, shocker to some people. I personally am kind of leaning towards annihilationist. Um oh. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know as in, um, same. I, uh, but uh, you, people go to hell, but hell itself is not um, permanent, and eventually people get thrown into the lake of fire and annihilated. Yeah, yeah, so that's they, right. That's they are eternally things. punished because they are eternally dead. There is a hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, but when the kingdom comes, hell and all of Satan and his demons and all the reprobates are thrown into the lake of fire and annihilated. Yep. That's right. That's why. I, so that's why I believe the emphasis on, because there's the whole debate, especially the universalists about whether uh, Ion refers like, uh, like, like Aeon in the plural, whether it refers to eternity or just some lesser sense of like unending, but not necessarily for all time in the future. Um, I think they have a lot of cope arguments for that, but otherwise I think there is a decent case where you can say the nuance may be that like it's unending. Hell is unending in the sense that, it doesn't go out on its own, but 
God will throw into the lake of fire and destroy in that sense. And so we can talk about, we can talk about, for example, um, one of those perpetual or unending fires, like, you know, those gas lit fires and all that in a sense where you can say that they're like a permanent unending um, fire. And yet you could just throw it away one day. So in the sense that it keeps going in itself and does not go, go away by itself, you can say that it's unending hell, but then it does eventually end by God destroying it. And their punishment and the punishment of hell is unending in that for the entire duration of that person's existence, they're going to be in hell. Now, eventually their existence is going to stop, but their punishment in hell in their existence doesn't end. That's, that's Just, kind of I think I can speak for us both when I think we, I can say Paul and I aren't rigid about this. Hmm. I'm open to changing my mind. If it turned out this wasn't the case, it's, it's, it, I'd just be yeah. like, oh, okay. it's, yeah. not, um, I, it's not something I hold on to very tightly. Someone said, um, sorry, someone said, is the intention of the problem of the action? The action in and of itself of burning a Bible is you're burning some pieces of paper with ink on it. That's mm-hmm. like the abstract thing that's happening. That's it, yeah. But what, what, what's actually happening sort of beyond that, sort of in the moral sphere as you are burning the word of God, right? Um, Joshua says, I understand this view has no biblical or patristic support. Uh, when Jesus says they'll burn up like chaff, chaff doesn't go, there's, it doesn't sort of smolder. It just goes, and then it's gone. Yeah. Um, but then also in Revelation, there is the lake of fire and people get thrown into the lake of fire and Revelation calls it the second death. Yes. Uh, which is quite interesting. And it's something that, you know, we need to grapple with and try and interpret. Um, yeah. And yeah. So yeah. again, yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's not much, right? There's, there's, there's some other little bits and pieces too. That's, that's not enough. And that's why Paul and I, I'm going to say, we're not going to like put this in a creed and hold on to it very tightly. Mm, yeah. But yeah. I lean, I lean towards that for sure. Yeah. I, I, this isn't, this is not, I want to make this really clear. This is not like a liberal thing. Yes. Like, not. Not like, oh, God, God wouldn't punish someone wouldn't forever. Punish. They are being punished forever. They're going to be dead forever. Yep. They ain't coming back. And they are going to go to hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes. It's not a liberal thing. It's no. for me, it's, it's trying to understand the second death and the lake of fire stuff. But, um, I, I will, I'm going to make a non-scriptural argument. And again, it's not something I hold on to very tightly, but I struggle to understand how when Jesus establishes the kingdom and everything, how everything can be completed and finished and God can have this definitive victory if the devil and the demons are still actually around. That's actually a really good point. That's Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's actually a really good point. You're, you're, you're walking around the kingdom of heaven, but you know that down below, you're still there. Satan, yeah, Satan's still there. It's sort of... I do struggle to understand that. If it turns out this isn't the case, I'm. This will literally be my reaction. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's not. I, I'm not that. It's. I'm yeah. not. Too, yeah. Like, I'm absent. It. Absent yeah. divine fiat. We don't. That is a curiosity that we can question. Um. Yeah. The other Philip. Good to see you, mate. I'm normally against icons depending on use because I believe God wants us to honor him in truth and image the most likely not true representations so much as they are imaginative paintings. Very true. Very true. That's more or less our case here um, in some. Uh, ooh, I'm up for debating annihilationism if you want, Josh. Ooh, man. Okay. I appreciate that, but I don't think I'd debate formally, not even a secondary issue for me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I missed most of the stream again. Rip. Oh, well, we have replay. Tertiary issue for me. Same. What would be the point of torment and hell for now if God could get obliterate them from the start instead of waiting till the end? Because he wants them to be aware of their punishment and he wants to set an example. So hell mm-hmm. is for them to acknowledge the almighty God and to suffer and to weep yes. and to gnash their teeth because they disobeyed him. That's justice. That's but it. then in my view, um, when God is, you know puts the kingdom of, of heaven on earth and, and sorts everything out, he doesn't need to make that display anymore because everything's done and dusted. That's and so it. they can be annihilated and we can just, we can close that chapter. Pretty much, pretty much. But Ehrman also accepts annihilationism, modern textual criticism. I mean, yay, the atheist. Yeah, the agnostic, yeah, agnostic, yay, the agnostic scholar. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I think what they're saying is that if you, if you approach scripture 
without sort of presuppositions of like tra- of what what tradition yeah. has said how we should interpret it you could you could view it that way sure yeah but even then it's like look everything is presuppositional yeah Bart exactly. just happens to have certain presuppositions which land him in the same spot as us in my opinion um we three should do a stream of annihilationism. That'd be a sick idea, actually. I'd, I'd be down for that. Hundred percent. I, I want to do some more thinking on it because, to, to be honest, with everyone, I haven't like I haven't thought through this issue too much. Mm. It's it's um, well, maybe it's, maybe maybe that could be a stream of just us giving our musings on it and developing our thought as we talk. I'd be keen for that because mm. even I haven't fully gone through every text and all that, but I'm otherwise, yeah, keen for a discussion like that. If you want, if you want. Someone said it wouldn't make sense for God to continue to sustain the existence of those who are not in Christ after the final judgment. Yeah, after the, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, yeah, I so agree with that. Everything gets completed. Everything is united to Christ. La la la. And then, yeah, those who aren't those who aren't in. Yeah, why why continue to sustain their existence? Yeah, yeah, sure. that's it. Yeah, I think we all agree. Hell will be horrible. Hundred percent agree. Ehrman supports it. Now I know I'm right, and that's it, mate. That's it. <laughs> What if Pope St. Pius X told me to burn Bibles? I'd sooner burn him, but yeah. Well, you know what? Um, in the end of the day, Roman in Roman Catholicism, the Pope, the papacy, is the ground of your faith. In Protestantism, it's Scripture. We, I will only believe what's true if it, if it coheres with Scripture, because it's the ground of my faith. That is not the case in Roman Catholicism. If the Pope has ex cathedra said something, it is true, and we will bend scripture and we will make it contradict itself and we will completely go against its plain sense just to make it so that Pope Pius X was right. That makes him the ground of faith. So ultimately, what a Roman Catholic believes in the Pope. Yep. God is ultimately revealed, supremely revealed in Pope Francis. Yes. That's that's it. There it is, guys. The Pope. Yep. Fundamentally. Yep fundamentally if, if everything else has to be warped to cohere to it that's the standard that's the something principle. the classic statement by ignatius of loyola beaten like a dead horse but still ever true something looks white the church says it's black i'm gonna believe the church etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. that's fundamentally what it is i mean i yeah. know like i remember seeing edward fees are trying to do some big blog post cope about oh he was being hyperbolic but it's, yes he's being hyperbolic but it's based on a fundamental truth like yeah. Something seems in every sense to be one way, but the church says otherwise, you just got to surrender your reason. Someone said um, the point The point would be, sorry, the point is to sustain their existence is so we can rejoice in their torment. Um, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. Like again, there are reasons to believe in, in eternal hell. Um, and that's obviously one of them. But it would just be a case of um, I, I, the way that I understand things, and I'm happy to be wrong, is that we won't need to rejoice in their torment because we will have the fullness of joy in Christ yep. and in our, in our full union to him. And we won't need that example anymore. So Augustine makes this point where, because Augustine, I do believe, believed in double predestination towards the end of his life. People either exist to be vessels of grace or to be vessels of you know God's justice. So we were, so blah, blah, blah. But the point is that when everything's united and sorted out, we... Uh, we, we would say that maybe God wouldn't need to make to do that anymore. But again, mm. having to be wrong, eschatological positions. Oh post mill. God. That's a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, just I'll just say post mill. I'm a post-mill. partial preterist. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I, I am really, really open minded on this, like really open minded. I'm very happy to become something else. But at the moment, I think that. Every, everything in the book of Revelation, except for like the last two chapters, already came true with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in AD 70. Um, but I also believe that those prophecies will be fulfilled in a more literal sense in the future. There you go. Uh, yeah. Same with the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is really significant for, um, uh, yeah, with like the Jerusalem destruction or even Eusebius talks about how um, the people in Jer- the Christians in Jerusalem, they remembered what the Lord said in the Olivet Discourse and fled and fled Jerusalem once the Romans came. Um, so that's, that's pretty pretty epic. I think that's a good sign of the meaning of Jesus. Saying, um, sorry, uh, sorry, a neo Schweiz Syrians like Dale Allison who say no, Jesus did believe he would return literally again in in their lifetime. It's like yeah, nah, sorry mate, you're wrong. Um, and- well, I've got really bad news, bro. We've got a comment here. Um, icons rule, bro. It's over. Ah, yeah, we're done. Craig, we're done for. Craig just this three whole hours and ten minutes, and we're done for. 
Okay, and I think speaking of the time, I think it might be a good time to wrap it up because this has been a bloody long time and I need to get on with my day. <laughs> Doing all of that discourse stream one day, one day. Like honestly, eschatology, that's one of those issues that like I'm least interested in because it's one where it's like, look, believe whatever. Like, there's some views where it's just like, okay, just don't believe that. But otherwise, it's like, look, it's going to happen. We're going to find out eventually. So <laughs> and your, your salvation doesn't really hinge much on it. Like at most, the most practical effect I see with eschatology is whether you're post mill or not. And that can affect um, the nature of the church's ministry on earth. Apart from that though, if you don't make it an issue, it won't be an issue. So that's mm -hmm. that's kind of that's kind of on me. Maybe I'll do it one day though. Maybe I will. Um, I'm going to say, when did Augustine hold a double presentation? Blah, 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 blah. Um, I have two articles on my blog, uh, New Kingdom blog on that. Um, okay, it's, cool. There you go. The, you know, has a whole book on or something. It's something that we have to kind of pry out from various statements and piece together. There you um, go. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, this okay. was it, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to wrap up. So, River, before we do, plug yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, right. So I've got a YouTube channel, New Kingdom Media. Um, check that out. Subscribe if you Link down wish. Below. Um, I've got a blog. The blog is really rough stuff. It's mainly just me just like putting putting crap out there it's not it's not very academic or anything there's some academic kind of stuff there but it's but yeah so but check it out i've got some 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 stuff there that's 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 kind of cool in my opinion and then there's the north american anglican articles i wrote recently the three of them that sort of were the um i guess sort of the motivation for doing this video um check that out uh yeah yeah Cool. There you go. There you go. And I'm going to be linking those articles as well right after we're done here. Um, but yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this was it. Thank you so much, River, for this stream. This was genuinely an excellent stream. I don't think very few others, if anyone at all, has done this kind of like a high level like discussion on this issue as, as Protestants, yep. um, let alone specifically on the Second Council of Nicaea, because that's very often not discussed just because it was only very recently when the full acts and documents were translated. And yeah. so we only had very, most people had only very limited information to go by, but now we're able to do some pretty pioneering stuff of what we did today. So um, yeah. yeah, I think that's extremely helpful. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for coming on, man. It was seriously oh, thank epic. Thank you for inviting me, man. It was great talking to you and a lot of fun. Yeah. hundred percent, mate. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you who are watching today. This has been River from New Kingdom Media. This has been The Other Paul. I hope you all have a lovely day or evening. God bless. See everyone. God bless you all.